Thank you. We are the Pension Task Force. Um, and it is August 25th, Wednesday. And just for your information, um, if you're sitting in the very middle, like in the back, when you stand up, your head is in front of the screen. Just a warning. <laughs> I mean, I don't care if your head shows up on your do, but okay. So, review from last time. We missed you, Michael. Thank you. Anybody comments or concerns or questions that came out of the last meeting? I want something to keep from watching another on um, YouTube that I thought might be helpful. I noticed this week this week you always say for the record for you. And um, I really thought of that when I was watching a meeting because we're so small, it's really hard to see who's speaking when you're watching. So it might be nice as we speak to say to say our name. Oh. Okay. Um, yeah. I, had a, I had a I had a thought just reflecting on some of the conversation around um, uh, taxpayers paying for public employee pensions, and um, you know I, I just I, I want to kind of avoid a us versus them um, dynamic in terms of uh, when we look at compensation between the private sector and public sector. It's really about total compensation and um, pension benefits are, are a part of, of providing the compensation to get those adequate um, those critical public services provided and I would love to see it if we could um, retirement security both in the public sector and private sector are, are an issue though. I would love to see it if we could address that in the report um, and potentially look at options that we might be able to um, look at in the future, like making the secure choice um, uh, program mandatory, potentially seeding that with state funds when it's available from you know when the unfunded liabilities paid down uh, to really lift up all people. I mean, uh, retirement, you know, pension benefits and retirement benefits in general are an economic development tool. They stimulate the economy. You know, retirees spend that money and that circles into other goods and services. Uh, so uh, just, uh, you know, I'd really like to, to, to look at how we lift all boats up. Thank you. <clears throat> I, I will, um, I think that this is enough. That was Eric. Oh yeah, sorry. Um, that uh, we certainly can make a statement to the effect that it would be good to have that. I think that we probably can't go very deep into that, but I think in the report, there's no reason why if we all agree, we couldn't just make a statement that we would like to encourage that um, the development and the implementation of that program. Um, oh, Andrew Emmerich, uh, just a follow up from last meeting. I, was, um, I reached out to Paul Sewell and Dan Juna, um, was waiting to hear back and confirm, uh, and they're both available September 9th, just trying to firm up what time works for them um, so that they don't both say 10 o'clock. Um, but they're both available for September 9th to come speak with us. Yeah. One will be via Zoom. Yes, I did get that note from you and I sent back uh, a reply saying good work, maybe a new sticky, and yes. you yeah. suggested yeah. you wanted one that smelled. Yes. And I couldn't <laughs> find it. Oh, uh, thank you for that. You looking. mean a scratch and sniff? Yeah. Yes. Oh. A sticky that smells. Yes. <laughs> Just to clarify, they talked about. Okay. <laughs> okay. Other picking up on Andrew's note, kind of on a more technical uh, level, and this is Eric again. Um, I attended a pension conference Monday and Tuesday, and um, I had the opportunity to connect with some of the NCPERS folks. Um, we had that conversation last time where they weren't going to be able to make it in. Uh, that time wouldn't work for them. But I think they are actually open to coming to, to speak to us. So um, maybe we can reach out to them again. Okay. And <laughs> Did, do you have a name of who you spoke to? Yeah, I spoke to um, Hank Kim, the executive director. Or it might be the CEO, but the head of the organization. Okay. Good. Thank you. You're the proper email. Okay. I can follow up. 
other comments, concerns? All right, so um, I don't know, I don't think it's 9.30 yet, we, but uh, we can, should we do the, is 20 minutes long enough to introduce the, uh, the RFP recommendation? Um, so the, I'll, I'll explain it, this is John Gannett, um, for the record, um, so Michael, Michael and Dan and I met yesterday to review the two proposals we received. Um, we went through the whole evaluation process, except for checking references. So Michael O'Grady this morning sent an email to the treasurer, who both of these firms have worked for the treasurer in the past, one in the 2009 Department Commission and one on disvestment in 2016. And so we are seeking input from her with respect to which firm um, you know, she would recommend. We hope to hear from her by lunchtime. And then we'll make our final recommendation to the task force. Thank you. So I guess if there's, we won't do anything there. Um, anything else that we need to, whether we should do before our guests are scheduled to be here at 9 30. They're going to be here on Zoom. I think that <clears throat> when I'm not sure that this makes a difference, but if they're on Zoom, we might, if we have questions or comments, I think we're going to have to really try to project our voices or maybe even, um, I might get slapped down here, but when we're speaking, just take off your mask when you're speaking to them and then put it back on because it is really hard to, to project and hear through the masks. Is that is that um, acceptable, Mike? To to do that when you're speaking? Correct. Young masks are encouraged in the state house for people that are not. Oh, I thought there was a mandate. No. It's a strong encouragement. Strongly encouraged. Okay. Can, can I say an opportunity? This is an opportunity for compassion for your teacher going back to school who will be teaching six and a half hours a day in the math and doing that exact struggle. Yeah. I like to look for opportunities for compassion. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Anything else to, before we, what time is it? 9.15. 9.15. Mm -hmm. Well, we have 15 minutes if anybody is there anything they'd like to talk about before, or we can see if they're ready, but if we schedule them for 9.30, I suspect that's when they'll be there, and that's when the Zoom invite was. Yeah. Um, Mike should be able to alert us. They're not in the room yet, I just sent them the link just to make sure that they're Okay. So, anything else that anybody would like to? Well, I, mean, I guess I we can report that uh, the actuary has come back the subsidization information. So we just need to put that on the agenda in an upcoming meeting. Let's look at the calendar. I'm really is a little calendar of meetings. So September 9th is our next meeting. And how much time do you think we should spend on that? Um, well, it only applies to the state employees, so that's something we should take into consideration. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the whole group task force should hear the report, um, but mm -hmm. then we probably should decide from that point how we want to handle it as a task force, just because it impacts just state employees, not teachers. So I do have two things that we um, could talk about right now. Are we not meeting the week of the 27th of September? I don't have a meeting schedule for that. Okay, we're not. Okay. And then maybe maybe we could take a couple minutes right now to talk about um, at the last the last meeting, Dan brought up the um, question about um, uh, any kind of public hearing. And um, I don't know how we want to do that. I've been thinking about that and I don't know if anybody has suggestions about how that might work. Um, 
might be nice if we were going to do something to have one north and one south and maybe split up the committee so that um, we didn't all have to go to both of them. But um, I don't know if that works or not. I have no idea. Are you, are you envisioning trying to find a physical location where we would I don't know. Meet oh, in, yes. Like in, in a gymnasium. I don't even know whether schools are going to be open I, to outside. I mean, last school year that yeah. there was no outside activities coming into. I don't, so know. I don't know if there's a town hall or anything like and that. We, we just got word from the superintendent. I thought it was a state thing, but it might have been just our district that said that schools can't have um, gatherings. That, that came in, that was actually second hand about a party that was going to happen. So maybe we should just think about doing Zoom somehow. I'm fine with that. I, I think sometimes Zoom allows the people that would normally be able to get there because of child care needs mm -hmm. to also participate. Um, even though I really do like the human element and being a person connecting, um, I wonder if just function wise. Mm -hmm. During the circumstances we're looking at, the Zoom might be most efficient and effective. So this when we ought to do this after our draft report, which would have questions and yeah, suggestions so and to late October. And do we do it in place of a meeting or in in addition to a meeting? Yeah. I would propose an addition um, just because our meetings are nine to four and actually getting teachers and state employees and troopers during that time, I think would be. Okay. So I'm comfortable adding on an evening time for um, a couple of hours. Our guests with us. <coughs> <laughs> okay, well let's let's think about that then for the um for a, some kind of a public hearing about figuring out when exactly and setting up a zoom for it and doing the, the outreach. Okay. So you want to introduce our guests since well, you only one is there. No, they're both uh, no, they're, oh, they're both there now. One picture and one oh I thought there was a picture of Sorry about that. Okay. Well, let me first check to make sure that the, they're there. Um, good morning, Keith. Good morning, Alice. Are you on now? Yes. Oh, there. Good morning. There we go. Morning. Um, so um, let me introduce um, Keith Brannard, um, who's the research director for the National Association of State and Administrate, retirement administrators and Alex Brown, who's a research administrator manager for the National Association of State Retirement Administrators. Um, and so just so you all know, um, I forwarded them the requests for information that we wanted that we had from our last meeting. And so I believe they are prepared to talk about pensions um, this morning. If we want follow up on OPEC, just given the amount of time they had to prepare, um, that, that is something that I don't think they're going to discuss this morning. Um, so, um, Keith and Alex, it's the floor is yours. And thank, thank you. you very much this morning. Do, uh, do I have the ability to share my screen? Yeah. We're working on it. Sorry about that. Do you hear that, Alex? You you can share your screen now. Okay. And I think that the acoustics in here are not the best, and we all have masks, and we're going to try to project, take off our masks when we're speaking. But if you can't hear us, if people have questions or concerns, please um, speak up. We'll. And I guess the question I would have is, do you want us to ask questions as you go through, or would you like to do your presentation and we reserve questions for when you're done? 
Uh, we, we talked about it earlier and we think that there are some natural transition points in our presentation that we, uh, where we could pause and uh, ask for questions on the preceding material. Great, thank you. Great. Um, well, uh, are you able to see my slides? Yes, we can. Great, thank you. Well, um, first I wanna express uh, our appreciation uh, to the task force uh, for your interest in public pension issues in your state uh, and for the opportunity to uh, discuss uh, those issues here with you this morning. Uh, this slide uh, provides uh, just a broad uh, overview of how we expect the uh, discussion to unfold this morning. Uh, we're gonna cover um, uh, some public pension issues, uh, especially pertinent uh, to uh, Vermont. Um, we'll uh, provide a comparison of benefits between the Vermont state employee system and teachers retirement systems uh, and regional peers uh, per the uh, task force request. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about pension reform trends uh, nationally and uh, some of the experience that you've had here in Vermont. Um, and uh, as a part of that pension reform discussion, um, we're going to spend a good amount of time talking about COLAs. And so we prepared a uh, comparative uh, co uh, discussion of COLA arrangements um, to highlight that plan design element specifically as well. Starting with a broad overview, um, some summary statistics uh, pertaining to public pensions in Vermont. Uh, these statistics are uh, all as of fiscal year 2020. Um, most of this information is provided by the US Census Bureau. Uh, census counts approximately 5 billion in uh, public pension assets in Vermont, the overwhelming majority of which are held by the state employees and teachers retirement systems. Uh, you can see the counts of active members. Um, active members are those currently working and accruing service credit toward an eventual retirement benefit. Um, and then annuitants uh, are those uh, currently receiving, currently retired and receiving retirement benefits. 248 million in uh, employer pension contributions to Vermont retirement systems made in FY20. Uh, 457 million in benefits paid out in FY20. And this uh, is a point that's uh, often lost in the discussion of public pension finance, um, that there's a lot of money uh, being uh, dispensed by these pension funds on an annual basis, 457 million uh, here in Vermont. And then we've listed the uh, FY uh, 2020 actuarial funding levels for the uh, three statewide systems here in Vermont, state employee system, uh, just a little over 66% uh, funded, uh, the teacher's retirement system, a little over 51%, funded and the uh, uh, most well-funded system is the uh, statewide municipal system at uh, just under 76% funded as of FY20. So um, some of the factors that we're going to uh, discuss um, at the beginning of this presentation are listed here on this slide, factors working for and against public pension plans improving their funding condition. Um, among the factors working in favor of uh, public pension plans improving their funding condition actuarially sufficient and surplus contributions. The surplus contributions would refer to contributions received um, by public pension plans above uh, the actuarially determined uh, employer contribution rates. Uh, investment returns above ass assumptions uh, obviously um, is another factor uh, driving uh, improvement in public pension uh, plan funding conditions. Uh, more aggressive amortization policies uh, and we'll get into amortization policy in uh, more detail later on, but a uh, more aggressive amortization policy would be a policy that uh, more rapidly eliminates an unfunded liability and therefore uh, creates more rapid improvement in the funding condition of a public pension plan. Uh, participants working longer, um, if participants work longer, they uh, uh, receive their retirement benefit later uh, and uh, in general uh, for uh, shorter duration. And then as we'll look at in uh, great detail later, uh, pension reforms uh, that reduce unfunded liabilities, so another uh, key factor working in favor of public pension plans. A couple uh, things working against uh, public pension plans at the same time, uh, lower investment return assumptions, um, which we've seen a number of in recent years, and especially so uh, in recent months, um, lower rates of payroll growth. Uh, payroll growth is, uh, chiefly determined by the number of public employees and uh, growth in their salaries, uh, both of which have uh, tended to be low, at least uh, in the aggregate or national picture 
uh, recently and uh, lower rates of payroll growth generally correspond to higher required employer contributions. Um, the, uh, the opposite of uh, participants working longer would be participants retiring sooner. And this is something that we're monitoring, um, especially uh, pertaining to the, the pandemic conditions that we're living in and uh, potential impacts on uh, participant decisions to uh, either retire sooner or delay retirement. But if uh, participants are found to be retiring sooner, uh, then they're going to be receiving that retirement benefit for a longer uh, period of time than they otherwise would if, uh, if they work longer. Then updated mortality assumptions to reflect um, improved expectations and life expectancy uh, to the extent that public pension plans are um, making corresponding updates to their mortality assumptions. Uh, this could add to the liability and cost uh, of the pension plan as well. And so we'll start, we, we have a number of uh, charts uh, that we prepare. We, we like to communicate about these issues through charts primarily. Uh, and starting with this first chart, uh, distribution of public pension funding levels uh, for FY20. Uh, there are about 120 or so uh, plans indicated on this chart. Each plan is represented by a bubble. Um, the size of the bubbles uh, is roughly proportionate to the size of the plan liability. So larger bubbles uh, equal larger plans, smaller bubbles equal smaller plans. Uh, the actuarial funding level is uh, the most popular and widely cited metric um, for assessing the, the condition of a public pension plan, um, but it's not the only relevant metric. Uh, and in fact, I think this is the only slide uh, in which we uh, discuss directly uh, the funding ratio, um, but it's, uh, it's good to set the stage uh, and see uh, especially where uh, uh, two largest statewide plans here in Vermont compare um, on a national basis. And so uh, you can see the position of the Vermont uh, state employee system and teacher uh, retirement system indicated here on this chart, uh, just to orient you uh, to the position of some other um, notable public pension plans on this chart. The, the large bubble uh, there in the center of the chart is the California Public Employees Retirement System, the nation's largest um, public retirement system. Directly to its left is the California State Teachers Retirement System, second largest, I believe. A um, couple of the larger bubbles uh, over to the, the right hand, uh, the, the upper northwest um, quadrant of this chart uh, that are among the largest and most well-funded uh, public pension plans in the country include the Wisconsin Retirement System, the New York State Local Retirement System, uh, New York State Teachers Retirement System, Tennessee Consolidated Retirement System, uh, South Dakota, uh, North Carolina, uh, and others. And so it's really interesting, you know, we, we think that uh, when you take uh, the totality of all of the uh, actuarial assumptions and methods, um, all of the funding conditions, all of the actuarial experience uh, for the largest 120 or so public pension plans in this chart, this is, this is what you get a fairly wide range uh, from about 40% that with one outlier down there below 20% uh, to several plans um, funded at uh, you know, 85% or, or greater. Um, and then the median and aggregate you know, in, the, in the low 70, uh, percent uh, funded ratio. So uh, beginning with, uh, with this slide, we're going to get into the uh, employer contribution experience, and I'd like to ask Keith to take over for a moment. Thanks, Alex. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, before I get going on this part, uh, any comments or questions to this point? You OK? okay. Uh, yes, we have one question. Great. One question, just um, in terms of that last slide, you know, the median uh, funding percentage being about 71% or so, um, how do we view what is a sort of a healthy funded percentage? Um, you know, there's a, there's a wide range there. I'd just be um, interested in your perspective on that. I mean, obviously 100 or, or better would be fantastic, but, you know, in, in, uh, in, in more practical terms, you know, how should we view what what a healthy funded percentage is. I'll I'll take a I'll take a shot at that, uh, if I might. And uh, often you will see the the benchmark of eighty percent referred to as a, as an indication of a healthy pension plan. Um, in the public sector, we believe that's a bit of a myth or a misnomer. 80% uh, does have relevance uh, among corporate pension plans that are regulated by the federal government. 80% triggers certain uh, requirements and events 
uh, for uh, corporate pension plans. Um, our overarching view with regard to uh, the, the condition of a public pension plan uh, is that it's problematic if, if funding the plan um, continuously going forward is causing fiscal distress for the plan sponsor, for the state and the cities that are, that are providing it. Um, as Alex indicated, the funding ratio is one measure uh, among many. Uh, it's the most recognized and popular measure of the condition of the public pension plan. Uh, but we would submit that uh, there could be a plan that's funded, uh, say, at 70 percent, uh, that um, is actually in, in better overall condition than a plan that might be funded at, uh, say, 90 percent. Uh, and that has to do with the reason for, among other things, the reasonableness of the uh, actuarial assumptions and methods, um, uh, the fiscal condition of the plan sponsor, the states and the cities that are sponsoring it, and, and other factors. So really, our... Um, our metric is whether or not uh, funding the plan adequately is uh, causing, is or is not causing fiscal distress. Thank you. We have a question. Uh, just a brief question the, on the previous slide, the small bubble below 20%, just curious what that one is. Um, if you can identify that. Yeah, that's the uh, uh, Kentucky uh, retirement system uh, plan for uh, non-hazardous employees, I believe. Is that right, Keith? That's correct. <clears throat> when we started this measurement, there was a, another plan. Uh, West Virginia Teachers was funded about that same level. And uh, that was about 20 years ago. And they are now funded uh, right around the median, right around 70%. They've made a concerted effort to uh, pay off their unfunded liability. They've applied a portion of uh, state budget, budget surplus monies to that. Uh, they've con consistently paid their required contribution and so on. They've not reduced benefits, but they have made a concerted effort to uh, eliminate their unfunded liability. Molly, did you have a question? I did. Um, Use the mic. The graph seen there is representative hey, Molly, can you use the mic here? Yeah, I think, I'm yes. wondering if the graph that we're looking at is um, representative of other years. You said you've been doing this about 20 years, or is it changing significantly right now or re in recent years? <clears throat> so we started measuring uh, in fiscal year 01, uh, which was the uh, all-time high uh, in the aggregate for public pension funding levels. They were funded at right around 100%. Uh, at that time, there were many plans that were funded at 100, over 100%. And you might recall that during the late 1990s, the investment markets were very strong. Uh, there were, I think, four consecutive years of double-digit uh, investment return periods. Um, and uh, then there was a very sharp market decline that uh, lasted from two until 2002. Um, and uh, that was followed by another market decline in 2007 to 2009. And as a result, in the aggregate, public pension funding levels have dropped from 2001 at uh, when they were about 100% to now about the low 70s. Um, we would point out, though, that uh, this uh, aggregate funding level uh, has been steady now for eight or nine years. Uh, once all of the investment losses of the uh, 08 of the Great Recession and the capital market decline at that time uh, were fully recognized, uh, public pension funding levels in the aggregate uh, have been very stable, right around 72%, uh, give or take uh, a little bit. And of course, these figures don't include the very strong uh, market returns of, uh, that uh, were experienced through fiscal 21, which we'll be seeing in the, uh, in the coming years. Thank you. So next uh, we'd like to, go sorry, right go ahead. ahead. No, uh, there don't, doesn't seem to be any more questions. So go right ahead. Thank you. So um, you all may be familiar with the annual required contribution and the actuarially determined contribution. Uh, those are terms that are provided by the Governmental Accounting Standards Board. Um, and the annual required contribution or ARC um, was in effect through fiscal 2014, and it was uh, supplanted in 2015 by the actuarially determined contribution, 
uh, for all intents and purposes, they're basically the same measure, which is the sum of the normal cost, the cost of the uh, retirement benefit that's accrued each year by plan participants, plus the cost to uh, amortize or pay off the plan's unfunded liability over a period of time. And the, uh, the fidelity to the ARC or ADC uh, is an indicator of the employer's commitment to, the, uh, to funding the pension plan. And you can see uh, 20 years of, uh, of the experience of the state employee's retirement system and the teacher retirement system in receiving its uh, required contributions. Uh, and certainly the last decade or so, uh, Vermont, Vermont uh, has been faithfully uh, funding at least, uh, in some cases uh, more so, um, its act, uh, annually, uh, actuarially determined contribution. So we, we, we took the um, major- I have one uh, question. Hold on just yes, a moment. One question. Yes, ma'am. Sure. I'm a member of uh, House my... Appropriations. Corey, can you help with the Thank you. Thanks. I'm a member of House Appropriations. So I'd, I'd like to know where you have the last slide. Um, I, I don't think it represents accurately what we've actually put in. It shows, and I'm now staring at it from afar, but the Vermont State Employees Funding um, 2010, 2009, in the 85 percentile, we put in 100 percent. I'd like to know where you got that slide from, please. Uh, normally, we get this information either from an actuarial valuation or a, a financial report, and we would be happy to go back and check that and get back with you and the committee. Please. Yes, sir. So we took that information uh, pertaining to the major statewide plans in every state. Um, we divided the uh, actual amount received uh, into the actually determined contribution uh, for each of the uh, major plans in every state plus the Dis District of Columbia uh, over the 19 years that ended in fiscal year 19. That's the latest that we have all of the data. And uh, so each of these bars represents one state. Uh, you can see the 100% line there. Vermont is just north of the 100% line. You can see the weighted average um, and uh, sort of a wide range. Uh, New Jersey is the one to the far left, and they have consistently uh, shorted their uh, pension contributions, and uh, they, they face uh, some, some challenges with regard to uh, funding their pension plan. But in the last few years, uh, they have uh, been making an earnest effort to uh, get back to full funding. And in fact, uh, in the coming fiscal year, that must be the fiscal year that just began, they have for the first time in more than uh, 25 years uh, fully funded their uh, pension contribution. But you can see where Vermont lays out uh, just north of 100% for this uh, time frame. So I'm, I'm gonna pick it back up here. Um, Keith mentioned uh, in uh, the slides that he just presented, the uh, component parts that comprise the actuarially determined contribution, the uh, normal cost um, or the cost um, to fund uh, an additional year of benefit accruals for current active participants and the amortization payment to um, amortize or pay down the uh, unfunded liability in accordance with the plan's amortization schedule. And these next few charts will uh, drill down a little bit on those components uh, for a comparable set of plans to Vermont um, and look at the Vermont experience as well. So this first uh, chart is presenting the distribution of total normal cost for social security eligible general employee and teacher plans for FY20. Uh, there are approximately 104 plans on this indicated on this chart, uh, each represented by um, a bar. The, uh, the median is uh, just below uh, 12% um, and that should be labeled on this chart, but it's uh, it's between uh, 11 and a half and 12%. Um, and then you can see the, the position of the three uh, statewide plans in Vermont. Um, state employees is uh, normal cost, uh, just above the median 12.7% or so, municipal system just over 11%, and the state teachers uh, system uh, is below the median at 10.6% uh, approximately. Um, one interesting thing worth noting about this chart uh, so uh, in, as of FY20, all of the statewide uh, normal costs for the statewide systems here in Vermont are more or less clustered uh, at or around the median level. Um, if we had produced this chart uh, for FY19, 
uh, as, as we did uh, at an earlier for an earlier uh, presentation to uh, um, the uh, legislature here in Vermont, uh, these normal cost figures for the statewide uh, plans of Vermont would have been uh, much lower. They would have been congregated around the left hand side of this chart. Um, but as you all know, uh, you recently re uh, reduced the uh, assumed rate of investment return uh, for the uh, pension plans here in Vermont from 7.5% to 7.0%. And that decrease produced a corresponding increase in the normal cost um, for these plans. Um, but despite that increase, and it's a, it's a pretty substantial um, decrease to the investment return assumption that was enacted. And, and despite that um, pretty significant action, uh, your normal cost rates are still um, more or less around around the median for comparable plans. So next, um, we look at the distribution of total normal costs paid by employees uh, for the same group of uh, social security eligible general employee and teacher plans for FY20. Um, and so what this chart is looking at, uh, so as, as you know, uh, employees make contributions uh, toward the uh, cost of their eventual uh, pension benefits. And what this chart is looking at is the uh, percentage of the normal cost rate, uh, those normal cost rates that we just looked at earlier, that employees are funding themselves through their own contributions. Um, and you can see for two of the uh, statewide systems here in Vermont, the state employees and municipal system, uh, that percentage is over 50%. So employees, so participants in those systems through their own contributions are funding uh, over one half uh, of their eventual retirement benefit, um, just under 50% for the state teacher system. And then you can see the, the median here for this group is um, approximately 49% uh, the benefit uh, funded through employee contributions. And then this third chart is presenting the distribution of the actuarially determined employer contribution that is directed to amortization of the unfunded liability, again, for that same uh, group of comparative plans for FY20. And so what, uh, what we're looking at on this chart is the percentage of the total employer's required contribution that is dedicated toward uh, funding the unfunded liability as opposed to funding the normal cost. And so you can see the, for, for the median plan, 70% uh, of that required employer contribution is uh, directed to the unfunded liability. And uh, for the plans here in Vermont, uh, the uh, municipal system, which um, again, as we looked at a couple slides back is the um, best funded, uh, most well-funded of the three statewide plans here in Vermont, um, just a little over one half of the required employer contribution to, to the municipal system is uh, dedicated to the unfunded liability. And then um, as the uh, statewide plans uh, you know, decline in funding level, um, the serves um, was just 66% uh, or so funded. Uh, so a little over 70% of uh, required employer contributions to SERS are dedicated to paying down unfunded liabilities and, and 80%, that figure is 80% for the uh, um, most poorly funded system here in Vermont, the state teachers retirement system. And um, another way we look at uh, pension costs and uh, employer spending on pensions is to look at uh, the percentage um, of uh, the pension contributions as a percentage, employer pension contributions as a percentage of all state and local government spending, uh, which is what is reflected here on this chart. This is for FY19, the latest year that this uh, information is available. Um, this information is maintained by the US Census Bureau. And uh, you can see that the uh, median uh, percentage of spending on pensions is just under 4%. Uh, the aggregate is uh, that one percentage point higher, um, a little over 5%. Uh, the, the reason that the aggregate is much higher than the median is you've got several uh, large states such as California, uh, Illinois, uh, Pennsylvania, and New York. Um, whose uh, percentage of spend, spending on pensions is much higher than the median and therefore is driving that aggregate figure to be higher. Um, you can see the position of Vermont um, just towards the uh, left-hand side of that chart, just under 3% um, of uh, all state and local spending in Vermont um, is represented by uh, employer pension contributions. And this chart invites uh, comparison among states, but there are several considerations uh, that are worth mentioning. Um, that are driving differences in these uh, pension spending percentages. You know, obviously benefit levels vary. Uh, Social Security uh, participation or lack thereof is a factor there. Um, approximately 40% of 
public school teachers and two thirds of public safety officers, as well as substantially all public employees in a handful of states uh, are outside social security. Um, and they tend to receive uh, higher benefits uh, and those benefits tend to um, cost more to fund um, to compensate for their, their lack of social security participation um, relative to states uh, whose public employees are participating in social security alongside um, their participation in a public retirement system. So that's a big factor that can drive differences in uh, pension costs among states. Also levels of unfunded liability uh, is another factor, differences in actuarial assumptions and methods. Um, and uh, as Keith noted uh, a moment ago, uh, employer uh, fidelity to paying the full required cost. Um, it is the case that some uh, employers don't pay uh, what they should uh, toward their pensions. Um, uh, other uh, employers in other states may be paying much uh, more than they're required to pay. And so those uh, differences and uh, contribution effort funding discipline um, can be reflected uh, on this chart. So that's just important to keep in mind. Okay, I'm gonna go again before I do. Any questions? I think we're all set for now. Thank you. All right, thank you. I'm gonna talk about demographics for a moment. Uh, the nation's workforce is maturing. Uh, as a nation, we are growing older. As a workforce, uh, we are uh, becoming more mature. Uh, and in a retirement sense, uh, maturing means a, a higher number of those who are receiving a benefit relative to those who are working and contributing to the pension plan. And we've plotted on this chart the ratio of active members, those who are working and contributing to the uh, state employees and teacher retirement systems in Vermont, uh, and compared that ratio to the national average. Uh, and you can see a lot of similarity there. Uh, Vermont is, uh, is a little bit below, uh, but uh, definitely in the ballpark. And you can see the change over the, the last 20 years, beginning at the, uh, uh, the onset of the measurement period in fiscal year 2001 for the United States as a whole, there were more than three uh, active workers in uh, public retirement plans, that's state and local retirement systems. Um, working, contributing relative to each individual who is receiving a benefit, uh, also known as annuitants. Uh, in Vermont, those were a little bit lower, but the rate of decline for the nation as a whole has been steeper. And you can see that, uh, the, that the three lines uh, come close to converging right around 1.2 during, uh, at, at the most recent measurement period, uh, at the end of the measurement period, fiscal year 20. Uh, and this has implications for how a, a pension plan is funded. Uh, and we can talk about uh, one of the more important uh, implications with the next slide, please. So uh, cash flow for a, a public pension plan is a, is a relevant indicator. And that decline in uh, the active to annuitant ratio is a, is a contributor to cash flow. Cash flow uh, is calculated as the uh, non-investment uh, revenue primarily, if not exclusively, contributions mm -hmm. into the plan, okay. minus um, money out, primarily benefits, also administrative expenses, and then divide it into the value of the assets. And so what this chart is showing is that most public pension plans have a negative cash flow. They are paying out each year more in benefits than they're receiving in contributions. Um, this is a figure that generally has been uh, declining, getting lower um, in a manner roughly consistent with that uh, chart we looked at a moment ago relating to the uh, active to annuitant ratio. If one were to go back to the 70s and 80s when we were uh, all much younger and we had more people uh, coming into the public sector workforce, getting out of college, relatively fewer retirees, uh, almost every public retirement system had a positive cash flow, some to the tune of four or five percent. Um, and in the aggregate, that figure has uh, steadily declined to where you see it uh, here today. A negative cash flow is not necessarily an indication of fiscal distress for a pension plan. Uh, it's the normal course uh, of, a, of a pension plan. It's uh, something that is expected by your actuaries. Um, if a plan is not receiving its full required contribution, uh, of course, that can contribute to a negative cash flow, and it also can uh, be an uh, indication of fiscal distress, or it can certainly cause 
fiscal distress. But by itself, a negative cash flow like this is not necessarily problematic. I would point out uh, the, the one bar on the far left-hand side there, um, and th that is a plan with a positive cash flow. And that plan we mentioned a little bit ago, that's the Kentucky retirement system. And that's the very poorly funded plan. And Kentucky uh, in the last few years uh, has really come to terms or tried to come to terms with the scope of their problem. And one of the uh, challenges that they were facing was that their uh, payroll was not growing. Their uh, state workforce was not growing. In fact, it was shrinking. And they found that the conventional method of funding their pension plan uh, as a percentage of payroll um, was inadequate, it, that the payroll was uh, growing so slowly. In fact, it was shrinking that uh, they were having to increase contributions uh, um, artificially and significantly in order to adequately fund their plan. So they switched to a, uh, an actuarial method of funding their pension plan that's based on a uh, consistent dollar amount rather than as a percentage of payroll. And that's why they're up there at 4%. That's just come about in the last year or two. They recognized that they were going to have to infuse more dollars into their pension plan if they were going to eliminate their unfunded liability. And that leads us to talk for a moment about payroll growth. Um, I'd like to analogize uh, for a moment uh, funding a pension plan uh, to uh, paying off a mortgage. Uh, and there are a number of similarities, and it's a helpful way to think about uh, eliminating an unfunded liability. So if one were to take out a mortgage and you had a uh, required payment, uh, you might have set the terms of that mortgage based on an expectation that your salary would grow at, say, 3% annually. Um, and then you would begin paying that each year or each month. And that salary that you're making is the basis of the, of the income that uh, you would be using to pay your mortgage. Uh, similarly, public pension plans have an expectation for uh, growth in payroll. And payroll, uh, as you might expect, is the product of the number of participants, active participants working uh, times their salaries. That uh, all adds up to the combined payroll of each plan. And actuaries typically, well, actuaries make an assumption about payroll growth. 3% uh, is a typical assumption. We've seen that come down a little bit recently, but 3% uh, still is, uh, is most typical. And when payroll growth is not, uh, uh, when payroll growth falls short of the, uh, of the assumption or the expectation, that means basically that the, that the source of income that's being used to fund the pension plan has less uh, than uh, it was anticipated. Uh, again, back to the mortgage analogy, it's like having a salary that is not meeting your expectations, but you still have that required payment. And so as a percentage of payroll, which is the way that you uh, typically will recognize your required employer contribution, um, that required contribution is gonna be higher. Uh, and so you can see on this chart, we've plotted uh, what a 3% annual growth would look like going back to fiscal year 09 as the base year. Uh, and then we've compared that with the public pension median. That's uh, 113 public pension plans that make up that median. And then we've plotted the uh, state employees and the teacher retirement system. In a payroll sense, the state employees have come much closer to their assumption. As you can see, just falling just short of the 3% uh, annual growth. There are uh, about six or eight more percent more state employees in Vermont today than there were a decade ago. Uh, but teachers have a different experience, and there are fewer teachers. Um, I don't remember the percentage, but it's uh, significantly fewer teachers today in Vermont, public school teachers, in, participating in the plan than there were 10 years ago. Um, and that is reflected in this, uh, in this black line here on the bottom that's indicating a very slow rate of payroll growth. That's uh, payroll growth probably of around, of around an average about 1% each year. And so as a result, um, the, the source of the, of the revenue or the source of the, of the income, if you will, that the state or its school districts would be using to uh, uh, make its pension contribution is smaller, smaller than the actuaries expected. And as a result, the uh, required contribution as a percentage of pay has had to go up. And so that explains uh, part of the reason why the teacher retirement system contribution has had to rise in recent years is because the, there's not been a, much of an increase um, in their salaries 
combined with a uh, declining um, actual number of public school teachers. So we're uh, we're going to shift the focus here to uh, investment return assumption and investment experience. Um, but before we uh, shift focus, um, I'd like to pause and ask uh, if there are any questions about the preceding material. Go ahead, Eric. Uh, thank you both for that information. I think it's very helpful in, in putting things in context. Um, related to those uh, graphs that show the distribution of plans, um, uh, do you have one for employer cost? I saw employee cost there, but just trying to put into perspective um, the employer cost in Vermont to, uh, across plans. So I, I think the question pertains to the uh, percentage of the total normal cost uh, paid by employees in FY20. And uh, I, we didn't produce a corresponding chart identifying the, the percentage uh, produced by employers, um, but we could. Um, and, uh, or it could just be interpreted as the difference between 100% and the percentage paid by employees um, would, would give you the percentage paid by employers. Alex, could uh, you go back to that? Could you go back to that chart, please, Alex? There we are. Yeah, so I was thinking about more, I, I, you know, I do have a copy of those 2019 charts and it, it's amazing to see how the charts have changed with the, uh, with the assumptions. Uh, there's one uh, distribution of employer pension, pension contribution rates. And what it looks to me is like as a percent of payroll uh, across plans. And I'd just be interested in knowing uh, how that's, where that uh, is. So are you are you asking how much uh, as a percentage of payroll employees are paying? No, it, employers uh, for uh, the two state plans, but really not not that in, in context of all of the other plans. So you're asking how much employers are contributing across the country as a percentage of pay? Correct. Correct. So, there's so in in the. The, that figure runs a wide range. Uh, and uh, just as a reminder, we're talking here about only about school teachers and general employees, not including uh, police officers, firefighters, and so on. Um, for social security eligible plans in the median, that figure is around uh, 14, 15%. Um, and it runs a range from below 10% to 50% uh, and more. Thank you, Keith, that was, that was my question. Okay, we have another, a couple more questions. So go ahead, Mike. Uh, thank you, thank you, uh, Keith and Alex. My question, um, I guess, relates to an earlier graph and then that missed actuarial assumption that we just went through. But it was interesting that Vermont was on the top of the state distribution list in terms of the ARC funding, but we were sort of, I guess, in the bottom percentage in terms of the funding ratio. So I was gonna, you know, what explains that other than actually, you know, other than actuarial assumptions, I guess, missed, if anything. Uh, could, could be um, multiple things. We're not sure that would come out in what's known as an attribution analysis uh, that an actuary would do, but it could be uh, any combination of actuarial experience, that is people living longer than you expect, people retiring sooner than you expect, uh, investment returns that uh, have fallen short of expectations. Um, those would be the uh, the leading culprits. There may be others. And and, and to that, I would add that um, on this chart, the uh, experience of the most recent decade, in which the uh, state employees and teachers uh, systems in many years have received uh, over 100%, uh, substantially so in several of these years uh, of their required contribution, uh, is most likely driving uh, the very uh, favorable position of Vermont on this chart, um, but but those contributions were you know were made in recent years. Uh, had these uh, surplus contributions been made 
uh, in the earlier part of this measurement period, then you know Vermont's position on this chart probably would still be um, about where it is currently, but potentially with um, a higher corresponding funding ratio because those excess contributions would have had uh, two decades to generate investment returns. Yeah, thank you. That's very helpful. Uh, go ahead, Peter. Grab that mic. Thank you. This is uh, again Peter Fagan. Um, you mentioned that the uh, as a percentage of of, uh, of payroll, the median nationwide was I think you said fourteen percent. Is that just pension? Does that include OPEB? Does not include OPEB. That's pensions for Social Security eligible employees, general employees, and teachers. And I was right when you said the uh, fourteen percent median. Yeah, if I'm remembering correctly, it's right in there. 14, 15 percent. Okay, thank you. And I, sh I should add that, uh, you know, as, as Alex indicated earlier, not every employer is paying their full required contribution, although in recent years, uh, I think on a national basis, employers have really made a, a much stronger effort to adequately fund their, their plans. But also there's variation in actuarial assumptions and other things that affect that. But that's where, about where it lays out, 14 to 15 percent. Other questions? Don't see any other questions. Okay, so as I mentioned, we're gonna shift focus a little bit and talk about uh, the investment return assumption experience and the uh, general uh, investment uh, performance um, in recent years, um, beginning with this slide, which identifies the uh, public pension fund sources of revenue for a 30 year period ended in uh, 2020. This is uh, based on information maintained by the U.S. Census Bureau. And uh, this is pretty much how it falls out for any 30-year period that you look at. Um, and we generally update this chart every year. Uh, employee contributions uh, for the 30-year period represent approximately $1 trillion in revenue uh, to public pension funds, uh, or about 12%. So a, uh, an important source of revenue, certainly. Um, a key source of uh, stable and predictable contributions coming into uh, public pension funds, um, but a, a relatively small percentage of the overall picture. Uh, employer contributions, uh, we get a little bit higher in terms of dollars and percentage, 2.4 trillion or 28%. Um, but the overwhelming majority of long-term uh, revenue coming into public pension funds is sourced from investment earnings, 60%, uh, a uh, little over 5 trillion. And as I indicated uh, a moment ago, this is, Pretty consistent for any 30-year period that you look at, you know, 60 to um, 60 to 65 percent or so of um, public pension fund revenues are derived from investment earnings. And uh, the reason we like to present this chart is because we think it uh, emphasizes the importance of uh, investment performance and uh, the investment return assumption uh, for public pension funds, given that uh, most of uh, the money that they're taking in is um, generated by investment earnings. And so then uh, this chart is looking at the, the change. Uh, we jump in with one question here. Go ahead, Peter. Thank you. So again, this is Peter Fagan. Um, I assume you may get to this, but certainly leading into the chart would be a, a you know it's a, a good lead in. Um, since this is a rolling thirty year, um, um, you know, consideration here, your the previous year, um, what is the average annual return and the combined annual growth rate on the on, on the investments here that is demonstrated in this chart? Nationwide, obviously. So I, I had some difficulty hearing the question, but I, I think um, it was asking about the average annual investment return. Average annual return on the investments. In other words, you can use a combined annual growth rate um, as another to ask the question. Uh, I'm not looking for, you know, for uh, three, five, ten. I just want to know um, the one year average. So, uh, we actually have some data on that for, for different time periods um, that we might uh, uh, present that and, and see if that uh, information is responsive to your question. Uh, and if not, uh, we can uh, discuss further, but, but that's coming up in, uh, in a couple slides. Great, thank you. 
So uh, given given the importance of or, or given the uh, uh, reliance of uh, public pension funds on investment earnings, that uh, um, really emphasizes the critical importance of getting the investment return assumption right. And there have been a number of uh, changes in recent years to investment return assumptions, which are identified on this chart. Um, there, there's a lot going on on this chart. Um, just to orient you a little bit, the uh, different uh, shaded sections of the bars correspond to a number of plans um, using uh, a specific investment return assumption or an investment return assumption within a specified range corresponding with the labels on the axis. Um, and you can sort of follow the, uh, the movement from left to right on this chart. And you can see beginning in about uh, FY10, FY11 or so, um, you see uh, uh, acceleration uh, in the pace of changes uh, to investment return assumptions. Um, and when I say changes, I'm, I'm talking about uh, reduced um, investment return assumptions. Um, and that uh, has pretty much continued um, all the way until uh, uh, present day. Um, our our, inform our uh, data set on investment return assumptions is prospective, so it includes changes that have been announced uh, but have not uh, been reflected in an in a, in actuarial valuation yet. And so that's why uh, our data set goes through FY22. And you can see that the median at the beginning of the measurement period was 8%, and it remained at 8% um, for the better part of a decade or so, and then has uh, begun to steadily decline uh, to, you know, 7.5%, 7.25% uh, to its present level of 7%, um, which uh, is also uh, the assumed rate of return used for the statewide plans here in Vermont, um, having just come down from seven and a half. And you can see, uh, you know, just how much of an outlier, um, you know, you would have been at seven and a half percent um, just a, a little bit previously um, before making that reduction to 7%, uh, which is now uh, consistent with the median investment return assumption. Um, so, sorry. I'm not sure what that glitch was, but nobody's trying to ask a question. So I, I think <laughs> we'll chalk it up to uh, Aaron's electrons. <laughs> okay, well, um, moving on. Um, you know, I mentioned uh, that the uh, period of um, significant changes to investment return assumptions began in uh, FY. Uh, 10, 11 or so corresponding with the, uh, you know, just coming out of the Great Recession, um, a period of uh, very low interest rates, low inflation, um, uh, forecasts for expected investment returns across many major asset classes were trending lower. And so that was really driving the, the, the decision uh, by many uh, plans to reduce their assumed rate of return, um, which has, uh, as I mentioned, continued uh, until the, uh, uh, until the present here were um, learning about a new um, reduction to an assumed rate of return seemingly uh, every week or every couple of weeks. Um, and we expect that uh, activity to uh, continue. Um, so, so why is this important? Well, as we just saw, um, the majority of public uh, pension fund revenues are derived from investment earnings and uh, all else equal, a uh, de decrease to the uh, assumed rate of um, investment return will produce a, an increase to the employer's required costs. If you're expecting less um, income to come in from investments, then that means uh, um, more must be uh, sourced from elsewhere, primarily uh, employer contributions. Um, and as we'll see in a moment, when we look at pension reform, uh, employee contributions have um, needed to uh, increase as well to correspond for the um, diminished uh, expectations for investment income. So now we're gonna uh, talk about investment performance um, and I'll ask uh, Keith to present this section. Thank you, Alex. Um, so these are investment returns for periods ended 6-30-20. Um, that's the end of your fiscal year, of course, and uh, it's fiscal year a year ago. Um, and uh, we have the uh, data for fiscal year ended 21. Um, but uh, we're focusing on 20 because we're focusing on uh, the, we, we have the other data, the actuarial data for the, uh, for the plan for that period as well. And so this is a helpful comparative. Uh, you can see for the one-year period, uh, the Vermont 
uh, we've, ta we've taken the Vermont teacher retirement system. There are minor differences, very minor differences in the asset allocation of the three statewide funds and uh, also very uh, minor differences in their returns. We're using the teacher retirement system, but the others have had a very similar experience, a little bit different, but very similar. So you can see where the uh, actual return falls out in the most recent periods, one in five years, the Vermont plans have uh, outperformed the national median over uh, the 10 year period, uh, it's fallen short. Um, I'm uh, certain that that uh, falling short there over the 10 year period has been a, a contributor um, to the, uh, um, <clears throat> the plans, uh, at least in part, of course, to the plans uh, actuarial condition. Um, and then over the longer time frame, 20 years, it's, uh, it's a poor return uh, relative to the expected return, but uh, compared to the national media, it's very similar. Ladies and gentlemen, may ah uh, welcome. It is so weird, you know. I haven't spoken on this podium since this was up. I feel like we're oh, there's something between us. Anyway, welcome. It is a total joy to have you here in our beloved Senator and Clarkson I have to say glorious state house. I am Allison Clarkson. I am one of your three on Windsor County now, state senators, and it is uh, a total thanks. pleasure to welcome you back after a year's hiatus of the first year's welcome to you class of 24. Uh, it's wonderful to have the Vermont first years uh, here in our beautiful state house, our living museum. And we're lucky enough to work here normally every day when our short session is in session. Uh, we are thrilled that you've chosen law school. Vermont needs your energy, your engagement, your diversity, and uh, that you bring to our small, great little and mighty state. Uh, I'm just curious because you are all new to Vermont. I saw most of you are anyway, some of you are Vermonters. How many of you are from another country? Oh, great. Some, but not as many as we'd hope. In other years, we've, we have more. How many from the West? Who've been burned east. Okay, great. And how many from the Midwest? Oh, great. And from the South? I'm not sure we want you here, but I mean, it's great. It's great. Given vaccine, only just given your vaccination rates. Remember, Vermont is a, a, we're a little nation proud at 85.2 percent vaccinated. And uh, how many of you are from the East? Great. And how many Vermonters? Woohoo! Great, great to have you. Uh, I too came to Vermont because of uh, the law school. <laughs> and uh, 30 years, it was 30 years ago, it's hard to believe, but 30 years ago, my husband, Oliver Goodenough, uh, who you, some of you will get to know, who's one of your professors at the law school, uh, we changed our lives completely and came up from New York uh, so that he could be and work and make his life at Vermont Law School. Our eldest son, Ward Goodenough, whose class of 15. Uh, he came to Vermont as a two and a half year old, uh, went away to university, actually went abroad to university, came back here and uh, is now actually your state's attorney for Windsor County. So be careful in Windsor County. When? So we're using, we're showing here the, S the returns of the S&P 500, and, uh, using those uh, as a proxy for uh, public pension fund investment returns. Of course, investment returns tend to not be as high as the S&P 500 because that's pure equities, um, but it is an indication of the uh, strength of, of returns. And so we've got three fiscal years laid out here. The first one is shown in blue and the uh, investment return in the, for the S&P 500 at that, uh, for that fiscal year was 5.4%. And we saw a moment ago that uh, Vermont's uh, investment return for the portfolio was 4.5% uh, above the national median of about 3.3%. Uh, and then there are uh, many plans that have a fiscal year end date uh, that uh, is consistent with the calendar year end, 1231. You can see the uh, S&P performance for that period was 16.3%. And uh, let's see, I believe that the median public pension fund investment return for that period was about 11%, 11 or 12%. And then we've just closed the uh, fiscal year 21 for plans that have a fiscal year end date of June 30th. And that's where we really experienced some spectacular returns. 
uh, median return for public pension funds for the year ended uh, 63021 was around 25%. Uh, and Vermont uh, reported a similar figure, right around 25%, a little north of that. Um, but those are not being recognized yet actuarially. Um, you should expect to see actuarial valuations for the, uh, your statewide plans in uh, December or January. Uh, and those actuarial valuations will be the first uh, official glimpse you see of the effect on the plan's condition and funding level of these spectacular investment returns. And I'll finish this segment on returns with a sort of a sobering note, uh, and that is uh, projected returns by asset class. So Horizon Actuarial Services puts this together. They gather a, uh, a consensus of blue chip uh, market forecasters, and these are, these are names that you would recognize. Uh, there's 20 or 25 nationally recognized investment consulting outfits that predict what uh, asset classes will return, individual classes will return over the next 10 years uh, or so. And you can see there's been a, a fairly steady decline uh, in expected returns going forward. Uh, you know, U.S. equities are the largest single component of most public pension portfolios. Uh, also, international equities, uh, bonds, real estate is right up there. And so if, if one were to assemble a, uh, a typical diversified portfolio, um, and if these returns were to be realized, we'd be looking at uh, returns over the next decade uh, of maybe six or six and a half percent. So that uh, spectacular 38% we saw in the S&P 500 last year uh, may not be uh, repeated anytime soon. So the, uh, the task force indicated an interest in uh, discussion, uh, discussing um, public pension plan amortization policies. And so we've uh, prepared uh, some material for that discussion. Um, uh, but before we transition to that subject, uh, I want to pause and take another opportunity for uh, any questions about the uh, preceding uh, investment discussion. I do have one question. Okay. Mike, this is, yeah. um, regarding the previous slide with the with U.S. Treasuries, um, I, I would presume a lot of the public pension plans are roughly 60-40 equities to, to Treasuries, bonds, et cetera, cash like instruments. And if they're paying low 2% um, going forward, uh, the, obviously the hope is for, for most pension plans is for yields to creep on the, on the treasury. But as long as we have a, a large and potentially growing uh, debt, it would behoove the federal government to be able to afford that by keeping, uh, by keeping those yields low so that they can afford it. Plus, it makes it difficult for pension plans to make anything shy of you know, to, to try to reach their goals uh, on an annual basis because they're plugging in 4% at below 2%. Are plans looking or changing from a 60-40 structure to something different? Yes, sir, they are. They have been for some time. The structure in lieu of 60-40, uh, I would say that uh, on a broad level, the structure is something closer to 50-25-25. That's 50% uh, U.S. and international equities. 25% to bonds, not just US Treasury, but also corporates and so forth. And then the other 25% uh, so-called alternatives that would be private equity, hedge funds, real estate. Thank you. I don't see any other questions, so go right ahead. Great, so uh, uh, shifting focus to uh, amortization policy. Uh, which we define uh, here on this slide as the uh, rules and processes that determine the length of time and the structure of payments required to systematically eliminate an unfunded liability uh, or to recognize a surplus. Uh, and an amortization policy is uh, an important component of a plan's uh, funding policy and a, a key determinant uh, of the plan's cost and funding outcomes. Um, an amortization policy is uh, defined further by several key elements, a, a non-exhaustive list um, of which are found on this slide. Uh, is the amortization period open or closed? Uh, a closed amortization period uh, essentially calls for the uh, unfunded liability to be eliminated within a specified time frame. Uh, conversely, an open or rolling amortization period uh, essentially resets each year. Uh, a plan with a closed amortization period may 
uh, choose to amortize the entire unfunded liability over the same period, uh, or may instead use layered amortization, uh, which is an approach that creates a new amortization schedule uh, for each year's actuarial experience. Establishing the length of the amortization period is another important decision. Uh, all else equal, a longer amortization period will produce lower amortization payments relative to a shorter amortization period. Uh, but if that period is particularly lengthy, um, that, that may come at the expense um, of the plan's ability to address its obligations within a reasonable time frame. Um, and then conversely, a shorter amortization period will result in higher payments and more rapid elimination of the unfunded liability. Uh, the amortization method is another important factor, and uh, Keith alluded to this a little bit uh, in his previous comments. Uh, amortization payments may be determined as a constant percentage of payroll with amortization peer, uh, payments expected to increase over time uh, commensurate with uh, expected payroll growth. Um, or another approach uh, is a level dollar approach, which produces amortization payments that are consistent um, in dollar terms uh, on an annual basis. Uh, and again, uh, this is not an exhaustive list. There are other important elements to amortization policy uh, other than those listed here. Alex, I've got another question in the queue. Thanks, Alex. Again, regarding the layered amortization approach, um, how many of those 105 plans, how many plans are, are utilizing a layered amortization schedule uh, for gains or losses? And, uh, and, and have, is that, is that a, a recent trend that is growing or shrinking or what please? So we identify, um, we recently collected um, some pretty detailed information on amortization policies, including the use of layered and non-layered amortization. And uh, we identify approximately 60% of uh, the plans that we collected this information for, which is um, a little over a hundred plans um, uh, that are using closed amortization period because lay, you know, layered versus non-layered is only relevant to plans that are using closed amortization. So 60% of plans using closed amortization periods are also using layered amortization. 40% uh, of plans with closed amortization periods are using non-layered uh, amortization. And um, you may also you know, wonder how many plans are using closed versus open amortization. The overwhelming majority, uh, over 90% or so of the plans that we examined are using closed amortization. So of that you know, 90%, 60%, uh, um, of those are using layered amortization. And in terms of trends, um, you know, we haven't, uh, uh, we've only collected this information for the most recent year, but our uh, sense, and, and you can tell a little bit um, of this from the uh, um, latest uh, actuarial and financial reports, uh, because they identify, you know, the initial layered year, which um, in general corresponds to the year uh, that the plan adopted layered amortization. Um, you know, some plans have um, been using this approach for decades. Uh, I think, you know, I, I've seen initial uh, layered years of 1999, uh, 2000, 2001, thereabouts. Um, but I would say that uh, most common, uh, the, the, the most common year of adoption is around 20, uh, 2013 to 2016 or so. So um, definitely for most plans, um, adoption of layered amortization uh, has occurred more recently but not necessarily in every case. So this slide um, titled Amortization Policy Preferences uh, reflects uh, material that is sourced uh, largely from the uh, paper, the white paper uh, that is cited at the bottom of the slide, Actuarial Funding Policies and Practices for Public Pension Plans, uh, which was published um, a couple of years ago by the Conference of Consulting actuaries. And this uh, paper is uh, generally considered to be the, uh, uh, the gold standard um, resource for uh, identifying uh, amortization policy and uh, recommended best practices. And uh, we provide the citation here at the bottom. We'd be happy to uh, provide you with a direct link to this resource uh, following our uh, presentation today as well, if you'd like. Um, and what this paper recommends is uh, uh, the use of layered amortization, multiple fixed amortization layers. Uh, so a new layer for um, actuarial experience. Uh, some plans also use different layers for uh, different sources of unfunded liability, such as um, benefit increases uh, or changes to actuarial methods or assumptions. Um, also can uh, uh, 
uh, be uh, reflected in their own layers. Uh, the paper uh, identifies an ideal amortization period uh, for actuarial experience gains and losses um, between uh, 15 to 20 years. Uh, and, and they say uh, further that uh, an amortization period longer than 20 years becomes uh, difficult to reconcile with demographic matching uh, to promote the policy objective of intergenerational equity, basically, um, uh, meaning that the, 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 the funding period is, is too long to be consistent with uh, uh, the objective to uh, fund the pension plan um, over, the, uh, uh, over the generation that is expected to benefit from um, the public employees who are um, providing public services and earning those pension benefits. Um, and then the paper also identifies uh, the fact that a period shorter than 15 years can uh, introduce uh, untenable volatility in uh, the cost of the plan and funding level. Um, obviously, a uh, uh, amortization period that is exceptionally short will uh, uh, produce payments that are much higher relative to a longer period. And if, uh, if the period is, is very short, then you can also have uh, extreme volatility from year to year as those uh, actuarial gains and losses are uh, reflected over uh, and, and funded over a shorter uh, period of time. And so I mentioned we collected this information um, for about 100 or so uh, statewide uh, pension plans, including uh, the state employees and teacher systems here in Vermont. Um, and we identify uh, that the amortization approach uh, used by uh, the retirement systems here in Vermont is a closed uh, level percent of payroll approach, uh, non, non layered. Um, uh, and, and per statute scheduled to amortize in 2038. And so, uh, you know, pursuant to the uh, material that we uh, just saw on the last slide, uh, as, that, uh, as that date um, gets nearer, that 2038 date gets nearer, um, it could uh, produce um, some exceptional volatility if the uh, uh, actuarial experience um, in those uh, years, you know, as we approach 2038 uh, deviates significantly from actuarial assumptions. Um, and so that's uh, something to uh, uh, be aware of as that uh, statutory date uh, approaches. And so we're at uh, another transition point here um, where we'd like to uh, uh, present and discuss uh, the uh, benefits comparison that we prepared and uh, that I believe was distributed um, to uh, all attendees of the task force in advance of this meeting. Um, but before we uh, move forward with that, um, just wanna make sure that there aren't any uh, questions about amortization policy or any of the preceding material. Yes, we have a question. Uh, thank you for that, that presentation on amortization, it's very helpful. Uh, the conference on consulting actuaries uh, with the recommendation for layered amortization, do they put forth a, a, a recommendation as far as uh, funding, uh, like, you know, as level dollar or um, a percent of payroll? This is Keith. I don't recall. Uh, as Alex indicated, we'd be happy to share that with you. Um, I, I think that it's probably would be to the actuaries axiomatic that if you're not, uh, if, you, if, you're, if you don't have an expectation to be meeting your payroll growth assumption, you might be better off using level dollar um, or else lowering your uh, payroll growth uh, assumption uh, to better align with your experience. Because if you're, if you're trying to fund the plan at a uh, payroll growth assumption that you're not reaching consistently, you're going to be underfunding your your plan and the cost is going to be rising, but we will we will take a look at that and get back. Thank you. Any other questions, folks? All right, I think we are ready to shift gears. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, as Alex indicated, we're going to take a look at this chart that we uh, provided. Hopefully, you all have a copy there, either electronically or a hard copy, uh, and that is the. Uh, handout. It's a one pager that reads uh, landscape benefit levels for general state employees and school teachers. Representative Gannon asked that we put this together. This is a uh, comparison of the basic elements of retirement plan provisions for Vermont teachers and state employees and your regional peers there in New England and the state of New York. Uh, and uh, 
one, one takeaway that we'd like to, uh, to leave with uh, this chart is that uh, the, a retirement benefit contains multiple components. Uh, that uh, we've tried to identify the primary components of a retirement benefit here on this chart. Social Security, of course, Alex, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Alex uh, talked a little bit about Social Security earlier. Um, as a reminder, 25, 30% of employees of state and local government in the United States do not participate in Social Security. That includes substantially all uh, public employees in Massachusetts, uh, many in Maine, um, some in Rhode Island. And so uh, whether or not an employee participates in Social Security is an important consideration uh, for obvious reasons in assessing their retirement benefit. You can also see the age and years of service. The information that's provided here relates to those employees who are hired today. Um, many or most of the plans that are listed here have so-called tiers. Um, I think that Vermont also has tiers that uh, are benefit levels for those who were hired uh, previously. Um, but uh, for comparative purposes, we've provided the information just for those employees who are hired today. And so you can see the, the, the retirement multiplier, the age, years of service, a cost of living adjustment or post-retirement benefit enhancement, how much employees contribute. Uh, the, this is something Alex talked about earlier, the employer normal cost, how much the employer is contributing toward the normal cost and then the total employer contribution. And so this, uh, the information that's on here largely defines the normal cost. That's sort of how the actuaries determine the, the normal cost um, is looking at taking into account all of these, uh, these different factors. And so, you know, it's, it's a little bit difficult to say, well, is Vermont better than or less than or more generous or less generous than the others? Because there's different uh, buttons, different levers here, different points of emphasis. And uh, Vermont uh, might have a little bit more generous um, cost of living adjustment than some of your uh, peers. But the uh, retirement multiplier is a, is a little bit lower compared to say uh, Connecticut teachers. And uh, for those in New York who uh, work long enough, they can hit 2%. Then again, it's higher for uh, some, of, some of the folks, the state employees in Connecticut and Rhode Island, they're participating in a hybrid plan. So it's difficult to say um, you know, which is more generous. And that's why we like to look at the normal cost because the normal cost is, a, is an indication of the overall cost of the plan. And even that is not perfect, but it's a better indicator. I, I have a question for you, um, Andrew Emmerich. Uh, looking at the employee contributions, you said that the information here is based off from somebody being hired today, correct? Yes, sir. Uh, I believe the employee contributions for teachers is not 5%. I believe it is 6% a change that happened back in 2010, um, just a note. Did you say for teachers is 6%? Correct, so new teacher today, the employee contribution is 6%, not 5%. Thank you very much, I'm sorry for that error and we will correct it. Thank you. Are there other questions? We have more slides to go through if, uh, if you I all do would. have one question. Go ahead, Molly. Hi, I'm Molly. Um, I, I had a question in the age and years of service. I just want to understand that where, you, where it says like 63 slash 10, 65 slash 10. Does that mean those people after 10 years are getting full benefit? So uh, uh, let's uh, take New Hampshire, for example, 65 and 10, uh, a New Hampshire um, public employee who has 10 years of service at age 65 will qualify for a full or unreduced retirement benefit. That's right. Okay, the two together, age 65 and 10 years. Yeah, I have to hit both there. There is an example or two of any here. Uh, in fact, you've got it for Vermont teachers, any age. I'm sorry, any years of service, uh, any age in Connecticut, if you've hit 35 years of service, but generally when those two go together, you have to hit them both. Okay, thank you. So just uh, again, clarify, I wanna make sure I understand that also, Molly, uh, Andrew speaking. So that means, for example, using New Hampshire, if you started teaching at 55 and then worked for 10 years at 65, you've hit 
your age and you've worked for 10 years, so you're eligible to retire at that point with your full benefit? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Not shown on here are reduced retirement benefits, which most retirement systems provide. Um, that will allow a, an employee to retire at an earlier age for uh, what's typically an actuarial reduction or maybe a higher reduction than actuarial. But we did not show that on here. All right, I have one more question. <laughs> Sorry, it's kind of a follow-up to this question, just to make sure I get that that change, the, the, that different structure in some of those other states. So if you are working in the early part of your career for 25 years in New Hampshire, but you're not yet 65. You don't get your full benefit until you turn 65. That's right. New Hampshire has effectively has said that they're not going to pay a retirement benefit uh, for, for the, these employees until age 65. I think fire, public safety has a lower threshold, but for uh, general employees and teachers, that's right. You got to hit that age. Thank you. Right, so uh, if that, sorry, Alex, please go ahead. I was just going to say if, if there are other questions, we'd be uh, happy to take those at uh, any point moving forward here. And um, but now we'll uh, initiate a discussion of uh, pension reform, which uh, uh, is somewhat related to the benefits comparison information that we just looked at. So we'll, we'll stay on this subject um, for most of the remainder of our presentation. Um, so starting with this slide, uh, talking about pension reforms in recent years. Uh, since 2009, uh, corresponding with the, with the Great Recession uh, and the uh, substantial increase in unfunded liabilities um, associated with the uh, investment losses of 2007-2008 and the uh, uh, corresponding recessions, uh, which uh, substantially challenged uh, many public employers' ability to pay uh, higher required costs to finance those newly created unfunded liabilities um, corresponding with, with those events, uh, nearly every state uh, modified public pension benefits, uh, funding arrangements, or both. And we identify here on this slide a couple uh, different ways in which uh, plan uh, designs were altered. Uh, higher contributions um, is, is a big one, um, often from employees, uh, usually from employers as well, and higher uh, employer contributions uh, could uh, take the form in uh, different cases um, of uh, legislatively um, uh, legislative enactments to increase statutory contribution rates uh, or just employers uh, whose contribution rates are tied to actuarially determined rates uh, having to pay more uh, as those actuarially determined rates uh, rose. Uh, lower benefits was another uh, common pension reform and uh, that uh, took a number of uh, different forms um, corresponding to some of those categories on the benefits comparison that Keith just described, uh, lower multipliers, uh, probably the most direct way of reducing pension benefits. Um, that change was, um, I, I think, in all uh, or nearly all instances uh, aimed at new, uh, new hires only, uh, so exempting current active participants. Uh, more required years of service uh, or a higher retirement age required to qualify for a normal or unreduced uh, retirement benefit. Uh, and then another um, big category of changes was um, to uh, post-retirement increases known as cost of living adjustments or COLAs. Um, in many cases, those were uh, reduced uh, or in some cases even suspended or outright eliminated um, during this period. Uh, we saw an increased uh, use of uh, what is known as hybrid uh, retirement plans and we'll get into more detail on hybrid plans as we move forward. Um, a major uh, overarching theme of this period of pension reform has been the uh, establishment uh, or the clarification or strengthening of existing uh, shared risk provisions and um, uh, the concept of risk and shared risk uh, for public uh, pension plans is something that we uh, also will uh, address in greater detail as we move forward in this section. And so uh, this slide attempts to uh, catalog our understanding of um, pension reform as you have experienced it here in Vermont. Um, our understanding is that uh, legislation enacted in 2008 and again in 2011 uh, increased the employee contribution rate for current active uh, participants of the Vermont State Employees Retirement System. Uh, this, this change is uh, uh, pretty consistent with other, uh, what other states have done, um, both in the uh, 
the type of change and who was affected. Uh, we saw many states uh, um, increase employee contribution rates through legislation. And uh, oftentimes those changes were uh, directed to current active participants as well as new hires. Uh, for the teacher's retirement system, our understanding is that uh, 2010 uh, legislation uh, specified a, a couple different uh, plan design changes, uh, including an increase to the employee contribution rate um, until such time as the uh, uh, teacher's system reaches a funding ratio of 90%. And as we uh, saw earlier, um, the current funding ratio is just above 50, uh, just above 51%. Um, so that 90% uh, threshold is likely a, a long ways off. And uh, we saw also that those the, that that change was paired with a, an increase to the normal retirement eligibility requirement for some current active participants, uh, specifically uh, current active participants more than five years away uh, from the, uh, the previous requirement uh, as of June 30th, 2010. And so that change um, was a little bit uh, typical and non-typical. Um, it was typical in the sense that uh, many other states uh, during this period chose to uh, increase um, either the age, years of service, or both uh, elements comprising normal retirement eligibility. Um, but in most cases, uh, those changes were uh, aimed only at new hires, um, so exempting all current active participants. And so what makes uh, Vermont a little bit uh, unique in this regard is applying that uh, increase to at least some current active participants. Uh, and then also a part of that uh, 2010 uh, legislative package was an increase uh, to the benefit multiplier and the maximum benefit percentage. And this is also um, a little bit unique uh, in the sense that uh, it, it increased um, benefits for uh, certain participants uh, in, in most states. Um, uh, pension reform legislation was uh, uh, solely um, uh, meant to, to decrease benefits and, and there was no uh, corresponding uh, benefit increases, at least in most cases. A couple of uh, considerations that we want to uh, highlight with regard to pension reform. Um, as I talked about a little bit uh, on the previous slides, uh, pension reform can be divided into one of two broad classes. Um, changes that affect future hires only, changes that affect current active uh, participants uh, as well. And current active participants could be further classified as those uh, currently uh, working and accruing service credit toward an eventual retirement benefit or uh, those who are already retired and receiving uh, their retirement benefit. Uh, most um, uh, benefit changes uh, in other states affected um, new hires only. Um, some, however, did affect uh, current active participants, particularly changes to COLAs. Um, uh, the, the dominant uh, affected group there was uh, those currently retired and receiving benefits. Also, in some cases, current active participants uh, had their COLAs uh, modified during this period. Another consideration uh, uh, is that in order to reduce the plan's unfunded liability by benefit changes, um, which is uh, uh, oftentimes the goal of pension reform, um, th that uh, sort of necessarily requires that the benefit levels of uh, current active participants or retirees be reduced. Um, obviously, you know, future hires do not, um, th th there's no actuarial accrued liability uh, for that group. Um, there, there is only liability for your current active participants uh, or your retirees. And so um, it sort of follows logically that if you want to um, reduce that liability uh, through pension reform, then that's going to require uh, making changes that affect um, e either current active participants, uh, retirees, or both. Um, and then relatedly, uh, this third point, reducing benefit levels only for future hires may alter the plan's cost trajectory, so it may result in a um, a change to the, to the long-term cost curve, um, but that will take many uh, decades to uh, reflect uh, in the condition and cost of the pension plan. And uh, those types of reforms uh, aimed at new hires only uh, by themselves uh, will not reduce the unfunded liability of the plan. Um, and so then just uh, you know, further emphasizing that point, uh, the most dramatic effects on unfunded liabilities have occurred by altering uh, cost of living adjustments for current retirees um, and, and this is the case because for many plans, uh, including uh, here in Vermont, as we'll look at in a moment, a, a substantial um, percentage of the actuarial accrued liability is uh, uh, committed to uh, those who are currently retired and receiving benefits. So it, it then makes sense that the 
um, the most significant changes uh, to those liabilities uh, will occur when uh, benefits for uh, uh, those currently retired uh, are modified. And, and typically that's uh, done through uh, modifying the, the cost of living adjustment rather than the, uh, the base uh, pension benefit that those retirees are receiving. So I'd like to turn it over to Keith to um, continue the pension reform discussion. Thanks, Alex. So following on to what Alex just said, uh, what actuaries will do in their valuation, you can find you can find this in the valuations for these plans, is they they will attribute uh, the uh, liabilities and the unfunded the, the liabilities associated. Um, with the different groups. And generally they divide these groups into two broad classes. One is actives, those who are working and contributing, and the other is uh, inactives, which is those who are retired and receiving a benefit and also those who have terminated, um, but have uh, kept their money uh, with the system and presumably will retire at some date uh, in the future. Uh, and so according to their actuarial valuations uh, for the state employees, 62% of, of all of the liabilities in that plan are associated with uh, folks who are retired or inactive uh, and 64% for the state teacher retirement system. What that means is uh, those liabilities for those groups, um, uh, for those plans is fairly baked in. Um, and really, the, the only, if you wanted to uh, affect those liabilities, if you wanted to reduce those for uh, those who are not active, um, that would require a change to the cost of living adjustment provision that would affect those populations. You could also affect the uh, liability associated with active members and uh, the way that we're not making a recommendation here, please don't misunderstand us. We're just talking in theory here. Uh, but the way to do that would be to uh, reduce benefit levels going forward. We don't purport to speak to the legality of that or the political nature of that. We're just pointing out actuarial facts. Thanks, Keith. Uh, so this uh, slide will begin a series of maps uh, that we've prepared and uh, use regularly to communicate about pension reform. These, uh, these maps um, provide a good indication of the, of the scope of different types of pension reform nationwide, not necessarily the magnitude, um, but, but, they're, but they're, we think that they're very useful. Um, starting with states that have increased employee contribution rates since 2009, um, as we indicate here, 38 states have made this change and uh, the, the magnitude of uh, these increases to employee contribution rate varies across states. In some cases, the, the increases were substantial, in other cases, uh, uh, phased or incremental. Um, some of the, uh, the majority of the, these uh, increases affected current active participants, uh, although some uh, increased employee contribution rates applied only to new hires. Uh, there are a couple of states that were non-contributory uh, prior to uh, uh, enacting uh, for the first time uh, an employee contribution rate for um, some of their participants. Uh, you might also be wondering why two of the states appear to be shaded uh, differently. Uh, that would be Utah and Maine. Um, and that uh, sort of feeds into a subject that we're going to get into in greater detail later um, of shared risk and very specifically variable contribution rates. Uh, Utah and Maine uh, passed legislation uh, that provided for the potential for employee contribution rates to rise. Um, but so far, those uh, increases, the, uh, the conditions required to uh, produce those um, increased employee contribution rates uh, have not yet materialized. So we thought it was appropriate to uh, indicate them differently here on this map. Next, uh, we're looking at states that reduced pension benefits since 2009, uh, 40 states um, indicated here on this map. And again, uh, corresponding to the uh, introductory slide, this uh, would reflect all of those different ways that we identified uh, in which uh, pension benefits uh, base or core pension benefits can be reduced. So this is lower multipliers, uh, longer vesting periods, um, increased uh, normal retirement uh, eligibility requirements either um, a higher retirement age or more years of service required to qualify for an unreduced retirement benefit. All of that reflected uh, in this map. And again, the uh, magnitude of the changes and who was affected by the changes um, will vary from state to state. And then next, uh, we're looking at states that have made adjustments to cost of living adjustments since 2009. And uh, COLA 
uh, changes fell into one of three broad categories generally, um, represented by the different color shading on this map. Um, states uh, shaded in green uh, made changes to coal as affecting new hires only. Um, that, that's uh, uh, easily the minority um, of changes aimed at new hires only. Uh, states shaded in blue uh, made changes affecting uh, current employees and new hires. And so all of the all the changes indicated here on this chart flow down. So if uh, current active participants were getting their COLA modified, um, those modifications also pertained uh, to new hires as well. And then the overwhelming majority of COLA changes, um, as indicated by the states uh, shaded in beige, uh, affected um, current retirees uh, as well. And uh, these changes uh, could be anything from, from lowering the uh, COLA percentage uh, to uh, eliminating the COLA outright or suspending it, uh, sometimes indefinitely, sometimes until a designated funded ratio is reached, um, or sometimes for a, a specific uh, period of time, such as two or three years. Um, 30 states uh, made changes to COLA since 2009, which uh, you know is certainly lower than the number of states that increase employee contributions or lower benefits, but it's worth uh, pointing out uh, the fact that not every state uh, provides an automatic cost of living adjustment um, to its uh, um, public employees, with retired public employees. So uh, states such as Texas, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, Georgia, North Carolina, and others um, only provide uh, ad hoc uh, cost of living adjustments which require the uh, approval uh, of, of an external entity such as the legislature or the retirement board in order to grant that benefit. So effectively those states that don't provide an automatic COLA um, didn't, didn't have a benefit to, uh, to cut or modify. Um, but in many cases, those states that only provide uh, ad hoc COLAs um, have also not uh, granted that benefit um, in a, a significant amount of time. And so we're going to uh, move next to a discussion of uh, risk sharing and shared risk elements of public pension plan design, which uh, I'd like to ask if uh, Keith would present. Thanks, Alex. Uh, yeah, as Alex indicated, risk sharing has been a dominant theme of uh, pension reform uh, over the last decade or so, um, perhaps matched by uh, just outright lower benefit levels or higher employee contributions. But uh, aside from those, we've seen an awful lot of risk sharing provisions. Um, the, the universal retirement uh, equation that we sometimes refer to, C plus I equals B plus E. The money that comes in has to equal the money out. Um, contributions plus investment earnings equals benefits plus expenses. It's a simple mathematical reality. You can't pay a benefit with money that you don't have. So over time, the money that's coming in, uh, the money that's going out has got to equal at least the money that uh, comes in. And in a traditional, at least theoretical, defined benefit or pension plan, uh, if it happens that revenues are not sufficient to pay benefits, contribution rates need to rise. Um, more often than not, those uh, higher contribution rates uh, have come from employers, not always, but usually. And the idea of risk sharing brings in the, the chance that employee contributions or benefit levels could be adjusted uh, under conditions like that when, there's not, when there is projected to not be enough revenue or assets to pay promised benefits. Three broad types of risk that retirement plans encounter, investment risk, the risk that investment performance may fall short of the assumption or expectation, inflation risk, the risk that inflation will erode the purchasing power of a retirement benefit, and then longevity risk, how long people will live. And if you've got a group of retirees who are outliving their, uh, their expectations uh, in a pension plan, it comes at the uh, cost of the plan. If it's a defined contribution or an individual retirement account, then it, uh, that risk is borne by the individual. They have a risk of outliving their retirement assets. But at a high level, three types of risk that uh, pension plans must consider and the plan design uh, is based around.
so as I, as I mentioned, uh, in a traditional defined benefit plan, the employer has borne all of the risk. But uh, th- that traditional theoretical plan really has, has not been in place in the public sector, certainly not for many years for most plans. Um, increasingly, especially over the last decade, but incrementally over the last 20 or 30 years, we've seen more and more risk moved uh, to be borne by employees. Uh, and we now see a fairly wide array of levels of risk and types of risk that are borne by employees. <clears throat> As you might expect in a typical defined contribution plan, uh, an employee bears all or nearly all of the risk. How long they're going to live, how much they contribute, how their investment performance uh, is, and so forth. In a traditional pension plan, employers, as we mentioned, typically bear all or most of the risk. But in reality, uh, in current public pension plans that we see across the country, we've seen this wide array of risk sharing between employees and employers. And again, the predominant theme we've seen in recent years is a shifting of different kinds of risk to different degrees from employers to employees. So this is a continuum that NASRA put together that's intended to sort of illustrate um, this risk, uh, it's obviously not a binary thing. It's a, it, it occurs on a continuum. And there's lots of shades of gray in here. And so on the left-hand side, uh, you, you really have your, <clears throat> excuse me, you have your uh, traditional corporate um, pension plan. And corporate pension plans uh, don't have employee contributions. The employer contributes all of that. The employer bears all of the risk. And uh, that is the plan that is, uh, is mostly gone away in the private sector. There's not very many employees in the private sector that are participating in a uh, traditional defined benefit plan. And the public sector uh, generally probably falls around 10 or 11 per uh, o'clock on this, if you think of it as a clock, where you've got a defined benefit plan in place, but the employees are sharing some of that risk. And then toward, uh, the, toward the top of that, about noon on the, uh, think of it, thinking of it as a clock, You've got traditional hybrid plans, combination defined benefit, defined contribution plans, where risk is fairly uh, uh, evenly distributed between employees and employers, cash balance plans similarly. And a moment ago, Alex referred to uh, these plan designs that we'll talk in more detail about in a moment, <clears throat> in which benefit levels or employee contribution rates uh, might change. And then as you get over to the right-hand side of the chart, you get into defined contribution plans with uh, reducing levels of employer uh, participation and risk. So uh, beginning with this slide, uh, we move from the uh, theoretical to the practical um, examples of risk sharing among public pension plans. Um, Before we move forward, uh, I'd like to pause and ask if there's any questions. Yeah, I, um, I have a couple of questions um, going back to um, some of the benefit changes side. Um, one's just a, a simple, first is a simple clarification. Um, and this is Eric speaking as well. Um, you said that most uh, benefit changes have not focused on current actives, um, but some of those are previously imp- implemented in Vermont uh, um, did. Is that is that correct? I think that mainly to the teacher system. Yes, um, I, I think I indicated that uh, Vermont is not uh, an outlier in the sense that you uh, made benefit reductions, um, but you are somewhat of an outlier in the sense that those uh, benefit reductions affected uh, some current active participants uh, rather than just new hires, which was the a prevailing approach in other states. Um, and it's worth mentioning, as Keith alluded to in uh, one of his earlier remarks, that uh, states differ with regard to their legal protections uh, for accrued pension benefits. And so um, those you know, differences in legal protections will uh, limit, in some cases, the extent um, of the, uh, the reforms that can be applied to, to different groups. Some, some states um, you know, have legal uh, prohibitions against making uh, changes to pension benefits for current employees um, at all. So effectively, those those states don't uh, don't have that that option to do what you did here in Vermont. Okay. 
Thank you. Two, two more questions. You mentioned, I believe it was West Virginia at one point, in that uh, they really improved their funded ratio, doing so without uh, benefit changes. So I, I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit more to the strategies to they've implemented. I'll, I'll take a shot at that. Um, what, what West Virginia did was just made a focused and concerted effort to fund their plan. Uh, you all might, might remember uh, the tobacco settlement monies where every state uh, got uh, some money from the big lawsuit that was filed against the big tobacco companies. And for, um, West Virginia applied a good portion of that, uh, I think like $800 million to pay down the unfunded liability of the teacher retirement system. On a few occasions when they had budget surpluses, they applied a portion of those budget surpluses to pay down their unfunded liability. So it was mostly just through an effort to fund their uh, plan. Thank you. Uh, the, the, the last question um, uh, goes to that attribution of risk. And it's something we've discussed a little bit here as a task force uh, that uh, we have certain targets that are in our enacting legislation uh, they relate to um, how the unfunded liability and ADEC have increased uh, since we made assumption changes primarily. And uh, those assumption changes affect, you know, uh, all uh, plan participants, retirees, those close to retirement, uh, and current actors. Um, yet we've been trying to be uh, thoughtful about how, uh, how those groups are affected. And I, I think that it brings in, you know, considerations of intergenerational equity, that essentially you may have a smaller group um, uh, responsible for uh, uh, liabilities accrued over a, a larger group. Uh, do you have any thoughts on, on how to um, uh, consider intergenerational equity in our, in our uh, work here? I, I guess I might say that uh, the, the big challenge of providing a retirement benefit uh, requires a, quite a balancing act. Um, you've, you've got to accommodate the, the needs and demands and expectations of different uh, your major stakeholder groups. And who are those groups? Uh, well, those are employees, of course, who uh, public employers need to attract and retain. Um, you've got uh, employers um, that uh, need to uh, attract and retain. And then you've got taxpayers who are paying a good portion of the cost of the benefit. And uh, it's very easy to uh, develop a, a retirement plan that uh, favors one group uh, over those others. But ultimately for a retirement plan to be effective and to be sustainable, uh, it's gotta meet the needs of all of those groups. And that's really the big challenge. So, you know, right now, I suppose that you could um, come up with a plan design that uh, significantly lowers benefits for, for new hires or say those who are not yet vested in your plan um, and uh, spares everybody else, including taxpayers and retirees and, and <clears throat> uh, actives who've been there a longer period of time. The problem is that you're going to, employers especially, are going to have a much more difficult time attracting and retaining qualified workers. Uh, so whatever changes uh, are going to be made, have got to keep in mind the, the needs of balancing the, those uh, needs of different stakeholder groups. Thank you. I have a question. Uh, Andrew speaking, I'm going back a little far, I think, to the uh, extra handout talking about the benefit levels in the, um, Vermont, New York, New Hampshire, Maine, Mass. Connecticut, Rhode Island. Um, I was just wondering, do you have the average benefit payout um, for the different states and the the different sections? There? Um, if you could, if you don't have that on hand, is that something you could get to us? And I would also just be kind of curious to know what the funding ratio is of these different states. And um, also thinking back to a previous slide where it was looking about the financial um, percentage commitment towards pensions for the entire state budget, I believe. Um, yeah, the, the average pay, the, the average payout is a knowable figure, and we're happy to get that for you, although I would caution that uh, um, pay, pension payouts will vary by employee group. Teachers tend to have the most longevity 
Um, teachers tend to uh, work a full career or more so relative to general employees. And so uh, in a typical plan, uh, um, average years of service for a teacher will be 25 or 30 years, whereas the average teacher, for, uh, average uh, tenure for a, a general employee will be maybe half of that or perhaps less. Um, and so if you were to get the, that, that data, the average pension payout, say, for the Massachusetts or the, yeah, the Massachusetts teacher retirement system, that will be different than that of the state employees retirement system. Uh, but those will be different from the New Hampshire retirement system. And the New Hampshire retirement system is unified. They put them all together there. You've got all the public safety and the uh, state employees and local government employees and, and uh, teachers as well. And so um, there's limited utility in comparing the average pension payout. Uh, it, it's just important to be sure one is comparing apples to apples. But we'd be happy to get that information for you. Thank you for that explanation. That makes sense. Uh, appreciate it. And sorry, one other thought, and that is, of course, the uh, availability of, or not of Social Security. Right. So, Alex, is this yours or mine? Uh, this is mine. Um, I'll, I'll present the next couple slides and then give you an opportunity to um, make some final remarks. Um, so as I mentioned, we're, we're going to move away from the, the theoretical um, discussion of risk sharing toward uh, uh, the practical application of risk sharing uh, to public pension plans. Um, we'll talk about a couple specific examples of risk sharing plan design elements uh, that are here listed on this slide, flexible employee contribution rates, adjustable benefit levels, uh, hybrid plans, and uh, contingent uh, or limited cost of living adjustments. So first we have another map. Um, this is identifying states uh, that added uh, shared risk plan design elements since 2009. In some cases, some of these states uh, had previously implemented uh, shared risk plan design elements, um, but they made some change uh, to uh, strengthen uh, or clarify uh, those elements. Um, and uh, again, uh, just like the other maps, this is a uh, provides a good indication of the scope of activity in this area, not necessarily the magnitude, all uh, different magnitude of changes reflected in this map. Um, but uh, almost half uh, of the country since 2009 has implemented what we would uh, characterize as a, a risk sharing plan design element um, in accordance with one of those uh, different, different uh, uh, example elements listed on the previous slide um, since 2009. And we expect um, more states to uh, uh, adopt a uh, risk sharing plan design elements moving forward. And uh, we're gonna go through some examples of uh, risk uh, sharing elements that have been used in the public sector. And uh, Keith, why don't you uh, uh, start us off and just take this uh, as far as you're able and I'll pick it up uh, after you. Thank you. So uh, th these are some examples of uh, contribution rates for employees that uh, can vary. Uh, in these states, the uh, Arizona State Retirement System, uh, Nevada PERS, which Arizona State Retirement System excludes uh, public safety personnel, it's teachers and state employees and local government workers who are not police officers and firefighters. Nevada, and this pertains to just about everybody there. And Wisconsin, same thing, just about everybody. The, the full contribution rate is shared equally between the employer and the employee. Uh, Maine is interesting. It's very similar, 55-45 split, but there's an upper limit on the amount that the uh, employee, uh, as a percentage of pay, that employees are required to pay. Similarly, Iowa, 60-40, employer-employee split. All new hires in California, and this pertains to teachers and participants in CalPERS, it does not necessarily include uh, some of the uh, other plans. Um, they are required to uh, split the normal cost. Uh, between employees and employers at least. So employees must pay at least one half of the normal cost. And then as the notation indicates, many employees in Montana and North Dakota are contributing at a rate that is promised to decline when the plan funding level reaches a future designated threshold. And we would note that when you link the employee contribution rate to the plan's actual cost, that is exposing employees to all of the plan's risks, inflation, longevity, investment performance and so on, because all of that is borne out and ultimately in the contribution. On the other side of the ledger, uh, flexible benefits. Uh, Michigan enacted a, an unusual uh, and I think interesting plan design a few years ago. Newly hired school teachers in Michigan 
since 2018, <coughs> excuse me, participate in a plan uh, that is measured annually. And when the actuary finds that the um, mortality or longevity experience has improved by at least one year, that is when teachers in that plan are found to be uh, projected to live at least one year longer than the normal retirement age for that plan ticks up by one year. And whenever it hits a full year, that required retirement age uh, ticks up one as well. Uh, your neighbors to your north, New Brunswick, Canada, they provide an interesting plan. It's a, basically a hybrid, con contains two basic components. Core benefit, you might think of as a, as a typical pension plan, and a second component that is variable. Um, and uh, that benefit at retirement could uh, vary uh, depending on the investment performance and the actuarial experience of the plan. And then a few years ago in uh, Texas, uh, Houston employees, and this pertains to all employees in the, in the city, firefighters, police officers, and general employees, uh, participate in a plan in which they set a target employer contribution rate. And uh, if or when the, uh, that required contribution rate varies, strays from that target by more or less than 5%, then uh, a series of triggers sets in. Uh, that begin with uh, reduction in benefits, may also include changes in contribution rates uh, and actuarial methods and assumptions. So as long as the employer contribution rate stays within that range, um, uh, benefits and contributions uh, stay the same. But if the experience causes the uh, required contribution rate to get outside of that range, then there's a series of very specific changes uh, that begin to take effect. I have a question, um, Andrew speaking, thinking of the Michigan public schools retirement system. Would the opposite be true if the mortality decreased by a full year that the uh, retirement age as well decreases? Uh, it's a good question. I'm not sure when they established that plan that they thought about that. Um, and I don't know. We'll be happy to look. Let's, let's hope that, that that does not materialize, but we'll uh, see to, look to find out for you. Yes, fingers crossed. Yes, Just curious. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's Thanks. a great question. And I would also take the opportunity to point out another uh, feature of that plan design uh, for Michigan public schools. And that is that uh, um, individuals who are within a, a certain number of years from qualifying for the existing normal retirement age, I believe five years out from qualifying for the uh, existing uh, normal retirement are, are exempted from any uh, from any increases. So, so those closest to uh, retirement uh, um, are th that chain that that uh, increase is uh, not applied to those uh, participants. Yeah, great point, Alex. Thanks for sharing that. And members, I have to apologize. I literally have to go catch a plane, and so I have to go. And but I'm going to leave this in the hands of uh, my capable colleague, Alex. And uh, it's been an honor and a privilege to be with you. We'll do our best to get back with you with some of the unanswered questions. And of course, you should always feel free to reach out to us if you have uh, questions about public pension issues. Thanks very much. Thank you so much for being with us today. Okay, so we don't have, uh, don't have too much further to go uh, as far as the prepared material. And uh, then we can uh, take some questions at the uh, at the end here. So uh, I mentioned another example of uh, risk sharing uh, elements of public plan design is uh, hybrid plans. And uh, undoubtedly, you've heard a lot about hybrid plans, um, probably know uh, a little bit, uh, but we'll just go over generally the uh, two most commonly recognized types of hybrid plans. Uh, the first uh, so-called combination hybrid plans or DBDC hybrid plans. Um, <laughs> A combination hybrid plan uh, is a, uh, provides a benefit comprised of multiple elements, a, a more modest a traditional pension plan combined with a mandatory or at least default participation in a defined contribution plan. And the way uh, that this plan shares risk is obviously employees uh, bear all or most of the risk um, within the DC plan component. And the uh, employer is uh, bearing some of the risk associated with the defined benefit plan but that risk is lower because the uh, uh, defined benefit a portion of the hybrid plan is uh, lower compared to a standalone defined benefit plan. 
Um, so there's a balance of, of risk uh, sort of inherent with these combination hybrid plans. Another uh, commonly recognized type of hybrid plan is a so-called cash balance plan. Uh, a cash balance plan provides a, a retirement benefit based on the accumulated balance of a notional or hypothetical retirement account uh, that provides uh, participants with a maximum uh, annual interest crediting rate. Uh, employer risk in cash balance plans is lower um, because generally that maximum interest crediting rate is lower than the plan's assumed rate of investment return. Um, many cash balance plans uh, do provide the opportunity for excess interest credits uh, above that um, interest crediting rate, uh, typically dependent on favorable investment performance. Um, so there's a little bit of a shared gain uh, component to cash balance plans as well, to the extent that employees may uh, share um, in that strong investment performance through increased uh, cash balance uh, interest credits. And uh, in most cash balance plans, uh, all or at least a portion of the benefit is available to be uh, annuitized um, upon attainment of certain retirement eligibility criteria. So uh, um, sort of similar um, characteristically to uh, traditional pension benefit that is paid in the form of a lifetime annuity. Um, cash balance plans in many cases have that uh, uh, same ability to, uh, to pay that benefit as a form of an annuity as well. And uh, so hybrid plans are, uh, have certainly grown in popularity in recent years, um, but they have been uh, in place in the public sector um, in some states for a very long period of time. Um, so we're looking back to uh, 1995. Uh, th this is a heat map. So the darker uh, the shade of the state, the uh, greater uh, percentage of public employees in that state uh, participating in one of those two hybrid plan types. So when we go back uh, uh, almost three decades ago to 1995, um, we see that there were hybrid plans in effect in two states, uh, Texas and Indiana. And Indiana for substantially all uh, public employees um, for a very long time, going back to the late 1940s, in fact, um, is, the, is the hybrid plan in Indiana. And then in Texas, um, similarly, uh, uh, going back to the 1950s or so for uh, municipal and county employees in that state um, who participate in a cash balance plan. Um, and then we fast forward to uh, the present day and we see that there are many more uh, states that have adopted hybrid plans. Um, but it is also the case that uh, many of these new hybrid plans applied uh, only to new hires. Um, so their uh, percentages of public employees participating in, hybrid, in these hybrid, new hybrid plans is still very low um, in many of these cases. Um, Virginia, uh, Tennessee, and Kansas are good examples of states that applied, uh, that created new hybrid plans for uh, substantially all newly hired uh, public employees in those states. And you can see their uh, uh, participation thresholds are uh, you know, still pretty low, but uh, are expected to increase as uh, um, employees in the previous years retire and are replaced by hybrid plan participants. Um, there's a pretty interesting contrast going on in New England um, between Connecticut and Rhode Island. Uh, Connecticut created a new hybrid plan a couple of years ago um, uh, that, uh, you know, was typically applied to new hires only. And so therefore, uh, you know, less than 5% of uh, public employees currently in that state are Participating in the hybrid plan, teachers were also exempted um, from that new hybrid plan in Connecticut as well, so only applied to uh, certain state employees. And then Rhode Island, on the other hand, created a hybrid plan uh, about a decade or so ago. Um, but rather than apply that change to only to new hires, um, certain current active participants were also required to participate in that hybrid plan, which uh, results in a, a participation rate of um, over 75% and growing. And uh, so you can, you can just sort of see um, the uh, uh, relative popularity of hybrid plans and the uh, uh, level of participation uh, in those states that uh, have adopted hybrid plans uh, on this map. I have a quick question, uh, and speaking, thinking about um, Texas from 1995 to 2021. Am I reading it correctly that previously Texas is 26 to 40 percent of um, participants in hybrids, but now it's 11 to 25 percent. Is there any? Is that correct? Yeah. So that's uh, just sort of a statistical anomaly. Um, the uh, the employee groups covered by uh, the hybrid plan in Texas 
um, uh, up until uh, a couple months ago was just uh, uh, county employees and municipal employees. And so, uh, you know, in 1995, um, those participants represented, uh, you know, 26% or greater of all public employees in Texas. And then, uh, you know, I, I guess uh, here by 2021, there have been more uh, teachers and, you know, state employees hired that, that have driven that percentage of county and municipal employees to be uh, lower than 26%, and therefore uh, within that 11 to 25% category. Um, but it, it's pretty consistently, you know, 25 to 27% or so. Um, now we will expect to see that uh, percentage increase in Texas because uh, a couple months ago, the Texas legislature established a uh, new ca a cash balance plan for uh, newly hired state employees um, in 2022 um, and onward, I believe. So uh, now in addition to the county and municipal employees um, who have been participating uh, uh, in a, as a longstanding matter in uh, cash balance plans, you'll also have the state employees. So <clears throat> that uh, participation threshold in Texas will be uh, expected to rise moving forward. Thank you. And uh, so we also mentioned another uh, method in which uh, public pension plans share risk among employers and uh, participants is through a contingent or limited cost of living adjustments. And broadly speaking, uh, contingent or limited COLA refers to a uh, um, post-retirement benefit adjustment whose uh, amount, uh, or in some cases, whose provision uh, depends on some uh, external factor, such as uh, the investment return, uh, the plan's funding level, um, perhaps the uh, rate of price inflation in the economy or some other factor. And there are a number of examples here in which uh, contingent COLAs can be made uh, to be contingent or limited, including delayed onset or minimum age. So you have to be a, um, retired for a certain number of years before you can receive a COLA or have attained a minimum age, such as uh, 65 or 67 or something like that to begin receiving a COLA. So effectively um, in those examples, the uh, employee or the, the, the participant is responsible for bearing all of the inflation risk uh, up to the point at which they're eligible to receive a COLA. So if that's you know two years or four years out of retirement, they're responsible effectively for um, bearing the inflation risk up to that point. Uh, other plans uh, apply the COLA only to a portion of the pension benefits. So the first say $10,000 in pension benefits is eligible to receive a COLA. Um, and for the, for the rest of the benefit, the uh, participant is uh, bearing the inflation risk for any uh, benefits that they're receiving that are not uh, covered by a COLA. And then COLAs that are linked to investment performance or linked to plan funding level, um, you know, those COLA designs are effectively sharing uh, all of the different types of risk, inflation, uh, longevity, uh, and investment, um, because to the extent that those uh, different actuarial factors can uh, affect the uh, funding level of the plan, um, then uh, the uh, participants are essentially exposed to those risks uh, through a COLA linked to the plan funding level. And uh, we conclude uh, with a, uh, a handout of COLA arrangements that uh, I think was uh, distributed in um, advance of this meeting. I'm gonna to attempt to share it here on the screen uh, in case uh, anybody does not have a copy, and we can uh, quickly go over that resource. So hopefully this is uh, presenting on, on your screen there in the room. Um, what, what this uh, handout is identifying is the uh, a little bit greater detail of the variations to uh, cost of living adjustments among public retirement systems. And we uh, List, them, uh, list some specific examples uh, according to these uh, uh, different uh, contingent or limited COLA categories, including delayed onset, minimum age. Um, and you can see uh, the uh, variation here in a delayed onset or minimum age COLAs. Um, uh, retirees uh, or, or uh, participants hired since uh, 2015 uh, in the state of Nevada uh, receive a COLA um, only after um, uh, three years of receiving benefits, and then uh, that COLA uh, increases um, as a percentage uh, the longer that the participant has been retired. So that's uh, 
um, sort of an interesting um, spin on the delayed onset concept. Um, and then uh, you can see uh, your uh, neighbor uh, to the west here, New York State and Local Retirement System and New York State Teachers Retirement System. Uh, participants who retire from those systems have to be uh, have to meet a certain uh, age and a years of service requirement um, to begin to receive a COLA. So if the participant retires uh, before uh, meeting uh, those requirements, then they, uh, they're not eligible to receive a COLA until they uh, have attained uh, those ages. <clears throat> Uh, some, uh, some plans provide uh, colas that are uh, non-compounded. So a compounded cola uh, provides uh, an increase, uh, not just on the, the base retirement benefit, but also on uh, colas that have been uh, awarded previously. Uh, simple cola, by contrast, uh, applies that benefit only to the, uh, the original uh, base benefit. And so uh, we identify three uh, plans that provide only a, a simple COLA or, or three examples. Um, I should say a plans to provide a simple COLA. Uh, one plan, Mississippi uh, Public Employees provides a, a simple COLA until reaching age 60 and then uh, adds the compounding effect uh, thereafter. Uh, so I mentioned um, earlier in the uh, pension reform discussion that a number of uh, plans um, effectively suspended their COLAs um, with the uh, suspension uh, sometimes uh, you know, term specific Colorado para for, for two years um, and then up in Maine for, for three years. And you can see some other examples. Um, an, another uh, method of implementing a COLA suspension is to uh, essentially suspend the COLA indefinitely as New Jersey did until the plans reach a designated funding level, um, which is, is gonna be pretty far off in New Jersey. They've got pretty for, poorly funded pension plans. So uh, their participants are not gonna receive a COLA for some time. Another common uh, method of providing COLAs is to tie the benefit to investment performance. Um, a number of states adopt that approach. Uh, among the more interesting approaches is uh, that which is used in South Dakota. So South Dakota is um, sort of an interesting example in that uh, they're statutorily required to maintain a, a funding level on a market basis of 100%. And if they fall below that threshold, um, they're required to take corrective actions um, to uh, bring themselves back uh, within 100% uh, funding on a market basis. And so um, to accomplish that, they've got this pretty interesting COLA design where uh, the uh, COLA is uh, linked uh, to the annual rate of inflation um, with a maximum of 3.5% and a minimum of 0%. Um, and is further determined by the uh, uh, COLA that is payable uh, given the plan's recent actuarial experience that would result in maintaining a funded ratio of at least 100%. So effectively they, they pay annually in COLA what they can afford to pay uh, while maintaining a 100% funded ratio. So if, that's, if, if they can't pay a COLA um, without dipping below 100% funded, um, then uh, the COLA for that year is zero. And, uh, Similarly, you know, if they can if they can pay one and a half or two and a half percent, whatever, depending on uh, uh, the rate of inflation as well, um, and maintain that hundred percent funded ratio, then then that's what they pay in in that year. So it varies uh, depending on um, their expected funding condition. And then finally, we list a couple examples where the coal is applied only to a portion of the benefit. In some cases, also with uh, delayed onset. So um, again, in these cases where uh, coal is applied only to a portion of the benefit. Um, you've got uh, the you've got you've got a shared risk situation uh, going on um, up until the uh, portion of the benefit that the cola applies to, and then for any additional benefit that the participant is receiving, they're effectively responsible for dealing with the inflation risk uh, on that excess benefit. And uh, that is the uh, that's the conclusion of our. A prepared material. And if there are any additional questions about uh, this section or anything that Keith or I discussed previously, I'd be happy to do my best to address them now. Go ahead. Uh, Andrew speaking. Uh, questions particular to this. The presentation was great. Thank you for all that information. Uh, I 
curious if you can speak to changes that any states implemented that they thought would be um, impactful that backfired and actually did not have the determined impact of the desired. Yeah, I can give you a couple specific examples. Um, so one uh, change that was pretty common, uh, pretty commonly enacted since 2009 that we didn't spend a lot of time discussing, but is relevant to this question is uh, increases to the vesting requirement. Uh, so otherwise known as the uh, amount of time uh, an employee must work in order to qualify uh, to receive an eventual pension benefit. Um, prior to uh, 2009, um, it was typical to see vesting periods of three to five years. And uh, following this period of um, significant pension reform, we you know, began to see vesting periods um, uh, of, of much higher than that, sometimes seven years, sometimes as many as 10 years. Uh, that a new hire must work to uh, qualify to receive a benefit from the plan. And uh, in at least two examples I can think of, and there may be more, um, vesting periods were increased, uh, and then uh, those increases were uh, rolled back after the uh, public employers in those states um, experienced difficulty attracting and retaining um, public workers um, who were uh, uh, you know, leaving, um, you know, potentially not uh, choosing to um, work for a public employer because of an exceptionally lengthy vesting period or who were deciding to leave a public service um, because they, they didn't think that they would meet that uh, lengthy vesting requirement. So that's uh, one very specific example um, of a change. And, and, and furthermore, uh, I, I believe in those states that uh, implemented longer vesting periods, um, you know, those changes were not uh, found to be uh, substantial drivers of cost reduction. So not only, you know, were they not saving any money, um, but they were uh, jeopardizing public employers' ability to attract and retain um, the type of talented workers they were, um, you know, trying to recruit to public service. <coughs> Excuse me. Go ahead, Eric. Um, yeah, I'd like to echo Andrew's comments on, on just uh, uh, thanking you for the presentation. So a lot of food for thought, um, really helpful. Um, one item we discussed as a task force is, uh, and this goes back to one of your first slides and looking at things that were for a pension plan and against it is um, how to incentivize people to actually work longer. And um, we've talked about some ideas but I'd just be interested if you've seen um, states um, do anything interesting in that in that regard or, or any other incentives to kind of drive the behavior that would uh, result in cost savings. Sure. Um, so obviously, you know, the, the most direct uh, incentive, um, you know, for employees to, to work longer would be to uh, increase either the... Uh, age, required age, and or years of service required to uh, attain a uh, normal or unreduced retirement benefit. Um, you know, that can provide a significant incentive um, to work longer to be able to uh, um, eventually receive a retirement benefit that's not subject to uh, actuarial reduction. Um, another example that we've seen, and uh, we could provide specific examples um, if you're interested, is a uh, um, an escalating multiplier. So uh, the way that works is, you know, you've got a, a benefit multiplier. Um, you've got different levels of benefit multipliers that correspond to um, different lengths of service. And I think New Mexico implemented this most recently for their teacher's plan. Um, so they've got a, um, a lower multiplier uh, for those who retire with 10 years of service. And then it's a correspondingly higher um, as you go up the number of years of service uh, resulting in, you know, a maximum multiplier um, at say 25 or 30 years of service. And so, you know, that can provide an incentive to, to work longer to uh, receive uh, an eventual retirement benefit that's um, calculated on the basis of a higher multiplier. Thank you.
Any other questions from task force members about this information we've been presented this morning? Yep, one. I have one more question. Sir, um, you know, one thing I was thinking about based on the presentation is whether, you know, there might be a couple of specific states that have recently gone through some reform initiatives in the last, you know, two, three, four, five years that are similar to Vermont that would be good to hear from them directly. I know, you know, if you had any things that, you know, jump to you in Maine and Rhode Island to me just because they're New England states and they took a couple of different approaches. I think it'd be interesting to hear from them as to why or why not certain approaches were taken. But, um, you know, those states or any other states, if you have any recommendations on that. Well, um, so, you know, every state is unique um, in several regards. And, um, you know, some, some states and some plans that are uh, in, geographic proximity to, to you in Vermont are, um, are different in important ways that, you know, make them um, perhaps not appropriate uh, comparative states. Um, you know, Maine and Massachusetts might be good examples of that. Um, participants uh, or public employees, I should say, in those states, uh, substantially all public employees in those states are outside social security. So those states have sort of a different uh, you know, benefit framework that they're operating under in the sense that the benefits they provide, um, you know, are, are generally uh, more generous uh, than those provided by uh, states whose uh, public employees are also covered by social security, you know, because they've got to compensate for the, for the lack of um, expected social security income. Um, so when we look at uh, states that are, uh, you know, whose situation is appropriately comparative to Vermont's, um, it's important to consider factors like that. Um, but we, we could certainly give that some thought and uh, maybe provide some specific examples of states that are, um, you know, we think are characteristically similar to Vermont, you know, whether they're in geographic proximity or, or elsewhere um, that might uh, be interesting and relevant um, to compare from a pension reform perspective. That'd be great. Go ahead, Peter. Thank you. So different states fund their pensions different, I'm sure. In Vermont, um, our total um, uh, pension and OPEP liability cost is approaching closely 14% of our general fund revenue on an annual basis. And it's getting difficult to, to afford that. Uh, it is, it's, it's up there. Um, I've heard, I've, for example, I read once that New Jersey actually increased tolls on the Garden State Parkway or the New Jersey Turnpike or both. And that money actually goes to reduce the unfunded liability. But do you have some kind of a, of a presentation or a chart or whatever that demonstrates what different states do? So, um, yeah, with, with regard to uh, New Jersey and the, and the toll revenue, um, that we refer to examples like that as uh, so-called dedicated funding sources or dedicated revenue sources. Um, basically, uh, um, revenue streams that have been established uh, for exclusive purpose of uh, delivering extra uh, revenue to the pension plan um, for purposes of reducing the unfunded liability. Uh, New, New Jersey's a good example. Uh, a couple of years ago, they uh, dedicated the, uh, the lottery fund and the annual uh, lottery fund proceeds uh, to paying down the uh, um, unfunded pension liability of their pension plans. Um, there are another uh, number of other arrangements, um, particularly states um, whose uh, revenue is uh, dependent on the uh, taxes levied on the extraction of natural resources. So like Montana, uh, Louisiana, um, you know, coal and, and oil states uh, have uh, in recent years uh, established dedicated revenue sources tied to uh, you know a percentage of um, those natural resource taxes uh, to, to fund their uh, pension plans. Um, we do list a number of those and similar examples on our website. Um, that's nasra.org under the uh, funding policies topic page. Um, you can find a list of um, other 
states and local governments that have implemented dedicated revenue sources to fund their pension plans. Um, I guess, you know, the, the challenge there is that um, that's, that's then, you know, pulling uh, revenue away from, uh, you know, potentially another, uh, an, another source to fund the pension plan. So it's not necessarily, you know, creating new revenue. It's, it's just moving it around, you know, from one place to another. Andrew, if you have another question. Um, so again, the benefit levels for kind of the Northeast states compared to Vermont, it's really useful to have. Um, is it possible to get information for kind of uh, states similar to Vermont spread out around the country? You know, thinking California would be a great comp, but are there some other states um, where we could get some info that are like Vermont? Yeah, um, we, we can certainly pull something together. Um, you know, one, factor that we've looked into uh, a little bit is uh, different states uh, level of urbanization. Um, urbanization defined as, you know, the, the percentage of the total states re residents living in or near cities. And uh, in general, we find that states with a higher um, percentage of uh, urbanization uh, generally provide, uh, you know, higher pension benefits, uh, accounting for these factors like that we've discussed, like social security participation or lack thereof. Um, and so that might be one uh, um, metric uh, within which to develop a comparative group, including Vermont, would be to look at states whose uh, um, you know, level of urbanization is, is similar uh, to yours here in Vermont. Vermont's obviously one of the, the least uh, urbanized states in the country. And I have one question. Um, one of the things we've been talking about as an idea is possibly giving people the option to opt into increased employee contributions in return for um, years of service credit. Are there any states doing something similar like that? Um, some creative thoughts? I, I think there are uh, examples. Um, well, so uh, in Pennsylvania, uh, Pennsylvania legislature a couple years ago uh, implemented a um, new tier uh, for new newly hired state employees and public school employees, and uh, that new tier includes uh, an elective option for those new participants, um, where they can elect uh, to choose between either a pure defined contribution plan or one of two hybrid plans, and the two hybrid plans have different uh, employee contribution rates and different multipliers. So essentially, if you want to receive a higher benefit, um, you can opt into doing so by paying a higher employee contribution rate. If you want to, um, you want to retain more of your uh, take-home pay, you can pay less in employee contributions and um, receive a less generous retirement benefit. So that's the that's one example that that comes to mind, um, and there uh, there are likely others as well. All right, any other questions from task force members? All right, well, Alex, I wanna say thank you again for, uh, for being with us this morning, bringing us a wealth of information that I suspect will take most of us a little time to, uh, to digest. Um, and I do appreciate your willingness to, to follow up with answers to a few of our questions. And, um, and so thank you so much. I think we're done here for this morning. And um, Alex, you have a great day. My pleasure. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to discuss these issues uh, with you this morning. Um, we do intend to follow up and we would encourage you to uh, reach out to us uh, if you have any questions or wish to continue the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that puts no. us to what time it is. It is 11.45 and that puts us at a much needed lunch break. Um, mm -hmm. Back at one.